castles dominated the medieval landscape. And Britain has some of the finest in the world. Today, most are decaying relics, many of their secrets buried in time. Now, historian Ruth Goodman and archaeologists Tom Pinfold and Peter Ginn are turning the clock back to relearn the secrets of the medieval castle builders. This is the ultimate medieval technology. The origin of our castles is distinctly French, introduced to Britain at the time of the Norman conquest of 1066. Three, two, one, Here in the Burgundy region of France is Guédelon Castle, the world's biggest archaeological experiment. A 25-year project to build a castle from scratch, using the same tools, techniques, and materials available in the 13th century. It's a lot of hard work at the coalface, because this is industry. For the next six months, Ruth, Peter, and Tom will experience the daily rigors of medieval construction. Drop down. Yeah. Yep. And everyday life. Looking really good, you know. How workers dressed oh. and ate. You can really smell your food. <laughs> and the art of combat. Oh. This is the story of how to build a medieval castle. It's March. Tom, Ruth, and Peter have traveled to saint fargeau a hundred miles south of Paris, where Guédelon Castle is being built. They're now 17 years into a 25-year project, and over the next few months, its most defining features, the towers, will take shape. That is just Ooh, something else. Look at those things up there. Oh, my goodness. Makes you dizzy. The team are meeting members of Guédelon's workforce. Master Mason, Florian Renucci, and site administrator, Sarah Preston. This is amazing! Well, thank you so much for coming so far to see our castle in the making. I'd like to introduce you, first of all, to Florian. Florian is our Master Mason, so he's going to be guiding you throughout your stay here. You oversee this entire project. That is amazing. That really is. <laughs> well, it, it's really simple. <laughs> I just have to know very well the castle. But you're almost like the puppet master. You have the people working in the quarry, the people working as masons, the carpenters. You've got to control everyone. Well, I prefer the image of a, a musical uh, conductor. We have to, to be in the same time working. <laughs> this is very important. The rhythm. Find the rhythm. rhythm. Yes, yeah. the rhythm. So it's like music. Well, if you're the conductor, and you've got the strings over there, and the cushion over there, and the timpani over there. I can play a triangle. <laughs> Building Guedelon is an enormous undertaking. It will require some 30,000 tonnes of stone that must be quarried, shaped, and lifted into position without modern machinery. There are also teams of woodcutters and carpenters constructing scaffolding, roofing, and doors. Blacksmiths making ironwork and tools, as well as tile makers and carters. In the 13th century, English workers crossed the channel to hone their skills in France. France is where architecture is happening. Castles, churches, we're looking at their built environment and thinking, wow, they're really good at that. And we're importing all those ideas into Britain. As a military historian, you're very used to reading the theories behind how castles are made. But hopefully, as an experimental archaeologist, I can actually test some of those theories, put them into practice. 13th century life, uh, there's a lot of questions surrounding it. There aren't that many records. So by the actual act of building this castle, it's almost like creating a window through which we can observe what 13th century life might have been like.
building a medieval castle began with a wooden model. So what is this model used for? In medieval times, they don't have a paper plan. Right. So they used to have a wood model. Well, I guess this is a way of the Lord saying, this is what I want my castle to look like. Yes, and, and the Lord, he can he change things uh, with the model. It's uh, very easy for him. <laughs> so I suppose a medieval building site uh, like you have here, you can easily have over 100 masons. They all can look at this and know the angles they need to be doing and the, and the, the wall that they're working on. Gedelon's design is typical of the 13th century. Many British castles, such as Harlech, Conway and Carnarvon, have a similar layout. Castles were not only for defence, they were a show of strength, a lord putting his stamp on the landscape. Inside the walls there were grand houses, with great halls, kitchens and even chapels. A thick wall surrounded by a dry moat protects an inner courtyard which itself is protected by six towers. Wow, this is the Great Tower. This is what Florian wants us to work on. When completed, the Great Tower will be almost 30 metres high, providing a lookout for approaching enemies. And with walls four metres thick, it's the castle's ultimate stronghold. So if we, if we, if we were the wall... I stand here, I'm inside. You're inside. That's four. I mean, that's massive. It just brings home how many tens of thousands of tons of stone will be in this castle when it's finished. Back then, the only way of transporting stone over land was using horse-drawn carts. Minimizing the distance it had to be moved was paramount. So, like many castles of the time, Guédelon is actually built in a quarry. In the quarry, we have the sandstone the primary building fabric. We also have the sand and the water that can be used to make the mortar. We have ochre, which again can be used for making pigments. We're on a clay lens here, and the clay can be used for firing tiles, roof tiles, floor tiles, and we're surrounded by forest, which is a source of timber. It's a source of fuel, so it can keep the blacksmiths going. Almost everything we need to build a castle is just a stone's throw away. Boys are put to work extracting blocks of sandstone under the watchful eye of a stonemason who's worked here for 16 years, Clément Girard. The first job, mm -hmm. the premier travail pour vous, yeah. c'est de faire des petits trous dans la pierre. Make the small stone. It's very difficult. You learn. Minute de travail. Clément's teaching the boys how to cut huge stones from the quarry into usable building blocks using just a hammer, a chisel, and a wedge. I don't think I've got the skills to do this. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a go. The pressure's on. I'm glad it's you and not me. <laughs> so making this hole to fit the wedge snugly. But obviously, Clement, with his years and years of experience, knows exactly how to orientate this. So the wedge goes into this one hole, you hit it, and that's going to cause a fracture in the already pre-existing sediment lines and it'll split in half. Clément, is it good? Oui, c'est bientôt fini. Bonne musique. <laughs> good music. Good music. And now, uh, Slade Jammer. Now, Slade Jammer. <laughs> wow, you can just see the fracture starting to appear. And this is not about brute force, it's about listening, it's about looking, precision engineering. Listen. Good. Perfect. I see this is a good omen, Tommy. The hardness of the sandstone varies considerably, depending on its iron content. The more iron, the harder the stone. So the medieval mason had a system of grading it. You've got three categories of stone here, the pith, the path, and the puff. You've got the pith, this sort of black, 
high iron content sandstone, and that's used for the major load-bearing parts of the castle. The path, this more reddish sandstone, and the soft one, the puff, sort of very yellowy, crumbly sandstone. It's always like we're shopping for stone, really, isn't it? We're coming out here, we're looking at the colours, and we can actually get what we want for the particular task we're about to do. These stones will form the main building blocks of the castle. Just as important as the stone were the workers. In the woods surrounding the castle, Ruth's setting up home. Building a castle involves such a lot of people and they've all got to live somewhere. So you get a sort of temporary community setting up at the edge of the building site as all these different people come and go with their various skills. And naturally over time that begins to become a bit more permanent, a village in the making. Indeed, many villages right across Europe, in Britain as well as in France, can actually trace their origin to being camps for workers on a building site. This small hovel is typical of a worker's home on a medieval building site. The workers' cottages somewhere like this were always going to be thrown up in a hurry and fairly sort of basic. But then so were those of most 13th century people. And this is our everything. This is all there is. Here is our kitchen, our living room, our sleeping quarters, just this one single space. Marvellous. Off-cut limestone. This will do perfect. The centrepiece of every medieval home was the fireplace. The fire was not just used for cooking. It also provided heat and light. In grand houses, obviously, they sort of, like, cobbled this whole area. <coughs> but we know from lots of archaeological digs that ordinary houses, it's just a patch on the ground. And also, I use a couple of bigger stones to balance pots on a bit. The cottage needs somewhere to store the staple foods of wheat and barley. Hi, Simon. Oh, hello, Ruth. How hello. are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Yeah. I nice was thinking you. about a grain arc. So Ruth is calling on English carpenter Simon Dunn to make a grain arc. I'm guessing that uh, making furniture in the 13th century was rather different from what a modern cabinet maker would do. Oh, certainly. Certainly very different from what anybody would do now or even in the last couple of hundred years. Mm -hmm. You're limited by the materials and the uh, tools available. In the 13th century, saws were expensive. So carpenters used them only when absolutely necessary. Instead, wood was split using wooden wedges. Wow, look at that, split all the way round down to there. Yeah, and then turn it over and work a bit further down. Gosh, this is faster than no, soaring, isn't... isn't it? Oh, absolutely. There we go. So that's in two. Simon splits the wood again to produce planks. So, that's, you know, I mean, that piece particularly is a really good piece of plank. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty flat. You can work with it. And that's a couple of minutes. I mean, I hate to think how long that would take to a sawn. The rough planks must now be smoothed off. This is a, a side axe. Um, it's just ground on one, one edge, so it's flat on the other. So you can just trim up the surface a bit. can more or less use an axe like a plane. Once all the planks are made, the arc is assembled without nails or glue. Pegs are your basic thing for joining furniture together. So is, instead of nails? pegs instead of nails, yes. So there are some things you do need a saw for. <laughs> 
So we'll just cut the uh, pegs off to size. Right. There's no glue or anything in here. So it's just wood. So it's just the wood holding it's the wood together. Just the wood together, holding and it's, wood together. Yeah. It's not going anywhere. So, are you happy with that then? I'm happy with that. Is that going to do the job? It'll do the job. <laughs> home isn't home without a grain arc. Absolutely not. Water was another vital resource for the building of a castle, and hundreds of gallons would have been used every day to make mortar alone. So, castles were always built near a plentiful supply. Tom and Peter have been sent to repair the castle's well. To hoist the bucket, it needs a new rope and pulley. How do you reckon that is? We're going to make rope. I reckon it's 10 metres down, give or take a metre. But I suspect they sunk this to a depth where they're never going to run out of water. Exactly. It's crucial for defence. It's crucial for life inside the castle once the castle's operational. You need to have that constant supply. And obviously, we need it now for our building. Go on, rope. I'm on pulley. Peter's commissioning a pulley from wood turner, Gary Baker. Well, the first stage is to select uh, a log. Yeah. And the pulley's going to be in this direction. OK. So you, you couldn't just cut a, a like, section through a, a log and just do that as a pulley? That would never work. Really? The problem with the end grain, it, yeah. it shrinks at different levels and it, it's just going to split apart. Right. So we're going to follow the grain this way. We're just going to rough chop it. Right. What's the wood that you're using then? This is uh, ash. Yeah. Ash is very a very dry wood and therefore when it dries it doesn't, doesn't move that much. It's not going to warp and crack. A mandrel is hammered into the centre of the roughly shaped wood so it can be turned on a pole lathe. Pole lathes like this have been used both in England and France since before the 10th century. So it's just a pedal, pulling the string around the mandrel yep. onto... And a flexible pole. And a pole, basically, all it does is lift the pedal back up. The roughly shaped ash is turned to make a cylinder. Say, uh, watching you, that is really, really hypnotic. But it looks natural. It is. It is. The, it's like the gymnasium, medieval <laughs> gymnasium. But you do get fit. As well as a pulley, they'll need a rope for the well. Rope is essential on a medieval building site to lift loads and bind scaffolding. Tom's commissioning a rope for the well from the castle's rope maker, Yvon Herroir. First, he lays hemp yarns along the rope walk to form four strands, each with 14 yarns. I can definitely see why this is called a rope walk. All we seem to do is walk up and down. For this 15-metre rope, he's actually walked half a mile. It's extraordinary. The four strands are now complete. Next, they must be twisted together. The first stage of the twisting will actually reduce the length of these strands by about 10%, so that's about 1.5 metres. So I'm estimating that's about there. When the traveller hits this mark, Yvonne knows the rope has been twisted the optimum number of times. Very slowly, the traveller's moving in. But with each turn that Yvonne does, we get something that I see as being rope. Gary's turning the cylinder into a pulley by cutting a groove in its rim. Just 
Take it off. There we go. It's so smooth and so fast. Stop. The yarns have been twisted to form strands. Then the strands are twisted in the opposite direction to form the finished rope. To make the strands, you twist the yarns in one direction. But to make the rope, you twist the strands against each other. That way, you create that tension and that torsion, and it stops them unraveling. Merci beaucoup. C'est terminé. C'est parfait. thread this through before you haul it up. Now Ruth and Peter can fit the pulley and rope to the well in the castle's courtyard. You know, traditionally, this is where people gossip, don't you? Standing round the well. Well, still is, standing round the water cooler. <laughs> Drop it down. Yeah. On a medieval construction site, the majority of the water is used to make mortar to fix the quarried sandstone in place. Okay. The production of the daily batch is supervised by Fabrice Mango. Right, Tom, we need 25 baskets of this sand. 25. And 50 of this one. Mortar makers had a vital role to play in the building of a castle, as the strength of the entire construction rested on their mixture. Formulas were closely guarded secrets and passed down from master to apprentice. Due to the huge amounts of sand required to build this castle, they try and source as much as possible from the local area. And luckily, having the quarry right there means you've got a huge amount of sand on tap. Lime is the key ingredient that adheres the stones to one another. It's made by heating limestone to 900 degrees and then mixing it with water to create slaked lime. You good? That looks very nice, Peter. Right now, I think the uh, experience is showing for the French guys. They're really putting me to shame. It's, uh, it's enjoyable work, though. I actually do feel like I'm now a bit more connected to the castle. You feel like being clean, don't you? Like, to be honest, Peter, some of us just get on and work. And like you, who seems to roll around and every bit of building material you can. Suits you, though. It's just, just that natural magnetism. You would tell all that grey hair is actually lime water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. He's actually just stressed from working with you. <laughs> Today's batch of mortar and sandstone are destined for the Great Tower. So far, it's reached a height of 18 meters, but when complete, it will be 30 meters high. The materials are hoisted to the top using a treadmill winch. The forerunner of the modern crane, it takes two people to power it and can lift over half a ton. I mean, these things are an absolute, well, godsend, aren't they? They are the machine of the medieval building site, <laughs> bringing up all the stone for the, for the walls. You see, we've got 500 kg of weight we're pulling up, and yet we manoeuvre it so easily, the two of us. My strength, your ballast. And look, there it is. This is the ultimate in medieval technology. To lower the cargo onto the tower, the boys simply walk in the other direction. OK, so walk. Slowly, slowly. Yeah.
So this is our stone, the sandstone from the quarry, and it will be graded into three lots, isn't it? The pith, the path, the puff, the... That's pith, isn't it? That's yeah, quite that's hard. Yeah, that's the hard. That's path. That's the medium. And there'll be a puff in there somewhere. That looks like puff. Get some of these. The pith, that very, very hard sandstone, that is used for facing, for the structure, for the, the external walls, whereas the path and the puff, that's used to infill the walls, tie it all together. Philippe yeah. Delage began his career as a builder over 40 years ago. For the last 10 years, he's worked at Guedelon, where he's perfected his skills as a stonemason. You are going to lay the mortar, right. but don't crush, yeah, just like this. If you're bricklaying, do you do that because it's got a flat surface, but the stone has to go in and the mortar has to go up into the stone. Yeah. So, so don't, don't flatten it, OK. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges is ensuring the walls are absolutely straight. The integrity of the entire tower depends on it. The solution is simplicity itself. A lead weight on the end of a string, known as a plumb line. I mean, the scaffolding here, you'll notice there's about a two inch gap, so you can get your plumb line down there and make sure the wall's absolutely straight, because if it's not, the tower starts going like that, it'll start going like that. Most of these medieval tools and techniques have been around for millennia and are still used on building sites today. Yeah. Like that? Yeah, like that. Just doing the rubble infill to the wall. So we've got the facing stone, the pith, the hard stone, and that is laid horizontally, so the grain runs as it is in the, in the ground. Actually, if you imagine a book, if you lay a book horizontally and you stand on it, it will support your weight, whereas if you lay a book vertically and you stand on it, it will collapse. However, the infill, that actually gets laid vertically, so the grain is going in the opposite direction, and that's because they're all stacked against each other and they push against each other around the tower, making this absolutely solid. All the tricks of the trade. Where's that mortar, Peter? Already in the wall, Tom, already. <laughs> another secret ingredient to transform what is, frankly, a muddy hole into somewhere comfy to live. Medieval sources tell us cottage floors were strewn with rushes, but just how they were laid is a bit of a mystery. What I think might be the answer is to keep it in bundles and lay them in a sort of herringbone fashion across the whole floor. Look at that. And the temperature difference between putting your hand there and putting your hand there is quite astonishing. <laughs> that is cold and wet and nasty. That is warm and dry and comfy. Every few weeks, Ruth will lay down new bundles of rushes. I think that when I get the fresh ones on top, what will happen is that the damp earth underneath will, as these crush down, will gradually compost, leaving you on top of new fresh reeds, well away from that, all dry and clean and warm. That's the theory. Nobody really knows quite how this works. We'll see. Back at the castle, Slowly and surely, the great tower is taking shape. But before they can build up the walls any further, a doorway into its third floor room must be installed. It's got some limestone that's been shaped by the masons. It's going to go to the great tower for the doorway into that top room. Um, we're just using this crane, as directed by uh, Philippe. Using this simple lever system, oh. one man can lift four times his own weight. There you go. Yeah, it's okay. Look. 
It's then raised up the tower using the treadwheel crane. I can see it coming up. Here it comes. It's OK. You can come. How do you find it, Peter? I'm as dizzy as you like. <laughs> it's a heart rate up. <laughs> yeah, bit of a sweat going. Well, this was the thing that built castles. And this was the thing that made men feel quite seasick whilst on dry land, like myself. Before the stones are fitted, a pinnacle is set into the stone, from which the door will be hung. It's held firmly in place using molten lead. So what they've done is they've built this reservoir out of clay, and that way you can pull the lead in, it's not going to drain off, and don't waste a valuable resource. The masons have just one chance to get this right, as the lead sets almost instantly once it hits the cold stone. Getting it wrong might mean the whole stone having to be replaced. Well, that looks brand new. <laughs> that looks fantastic. It's amazing to think in a building of this size how little metal is actually used. But where it is used, it is essential. Now the stones can be set in place on a layer of mortar it's essential that they're perfectly aligned. So the forerunner of the spirit level, the mason's level, is used. Roman Britain, medieval France, or even a modern day building site, these are tools and techniques that every builder would have been familiar with. These have been honed over centuries of use. It is timeless, it really is. It's look good now, yeah. Our medieval yeah. square here. Says it's all, it's all good. It's ready to, for the next stone. Now the stone lintel that will top the doorway can be fitted. This is very, very delicate work. This is an extremely heavy stone, possibly the heaviest stone we've moved so far. And that is a serious bit of kit and it, it struggles to lift this, it's so heavy. I think we're right on the weight limit. Maneuvering this heavy stone with the simple crane is tricky. Good. Okay. Got it, Peter. One slip and serious damage could be done to both the lintel and the surrounding stonework. You got that, Tom? Si on est, si on est. Yeah. Yes, well done. <laughs> oh, I felt quite That's... vulnerable then, I've got to be honest. It's almost perfect. Yeah. Stone masonry, like so many medieval jobs, was heavy work. So a well-fed workforce was essential. To prepare food in the cottage, Ruth needs cooking vessels. Today, pots and pans are metal, but in the Middle Ages, they were often clay. Ruth is calling on the services of English potter, Jim Newbolt. When would people think about cooking with, with pottery? I mean. I think people are scared of it, the idea of it now, but it used to be the yeah. way of cooking. I mean, it's the oldest form of, of cooking utensil of any sort. That's it. Even your iron ones are called cooking pots. There's the clue. First, Jim makes the basic cooking pot on the wheel. He then fits handles so it can be lifted on and off the fire. And what I'm doing is extruding the clay. Stretching it out. Oh. So it means that as you pull the handle, it creates the grain. I so would. it's going to be stronger than if it was just squashed, squashed together. together. Clay is heavy and difficult to transport, so potters sourced it from as near to home as possible. Where do you get your clay from, then? From as close as the side of the road as you possibly can. That's a pothole. One way you could lose a wagon and team <laughs> into it. You, That's fabulous. You pull over. It's a hole where you've dug clay for pots. It's a you, pothole. You pull over to let another wagon pass and glance past. Whoa, you're gonna go. Next, Jim reshapes the base of the pot. So what shape is best then for fire? For cook pots on the fire, big round bottoms. Right, you want a, a, no sharp corners. No, no, it means that the heat moves around the outside of the pot. And then with a sharp bladed knife, we start taking off the edge there. As long as the pot's made evenly, It'll work better right, on so the fire. Right, so if there's fire. big thick lumps somewhere, That's then you're it. going to have problems around that. I'm flaring it out, 
The round bottom means it won't sit on a flat surface. So the medieval pot often had legs. But there's the, the cook pot. The hovel is now fully equipped and ready to sustain the workers. This is perhaps the most important thing in it. This is our larder, our fridge, our pantry, our food supply, a grain arc. Lovely, isn't that? Well, there it is. This is the mainstay of our diet. This is our main food. It's the, the, the starch, the bulk, and it's also the source of any beer or ale we might drink. And the lid is not attached because it goes that way up and it becomes my dough trough when I need to make bread. It's really clever, isn't it? Simple. And then I've got all sorts of food supplies hanging about, and hanging is the operative word, because I don't want anything on the floor where mice and rats can get it, so hanging it either from the walls, like the, the vegetables in nets, or from the underside of the roof, keeps them safe away from all the crawling vermin, and the smoke, as it percolates its way out, keeps away flies. You can think of this space not just as a living space, but as a storage space. After a day's work, the boys have returned to put Ruth's experimental rush floor to the test. You've spent all day working on the castle, you're tired, just come back. I mean, this is insulating, it's cushioning, it's, it's quite not as comfy. bad as you think, is it's it? It's not as bad as you think, is it? I mean, when they say they haven't got a bed and that's, that's it, you just get a blanket and this is what you sleep on, it sounds a bit horrendous, but it's not. It's all right. It is a tiny space, though, to live your complete life, just one little space like this, isn't it? Yeah, As a I'm, whole family. I'm much right. Well, you say it's a tiny space to live your entire life. I mean, I'd rather be in a small space like this and get the heat in. You know, it's an yeah, easier, easier space good point. to heat. And also, how much time are you going to spend in here, really? Like, these days, you think, like, you know, a sitting room with a TV and a big sofa, because you're going to relax in there. We're going to be working most of the time, and you've got all your yeah. jobs and tasks to do. Yeah. So that's sort of like... Rest and relaxation isn't as important. It's less time for it. Mm. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Salute. They don't clink, do they? <laughs> That's about the only thing I've got against drinking bowls. They don't clink. <laughs>
that her chin was sagging a bit and she wasn't looking quite as lovely as she did. So she invented a barbette, which goes under the chin and onto the top of the head and pins there. And then with a barbette, you always wear a fillet. And uh, this is fillet, it's just another band sewn into a circle. And you wear that almost crown-like on top. It's a very 13th century look. So that's it. My French look. <laughs> Today, Tom and Peter have been summoned to the Mason's Lodge for the next stage of their apprenticeship, carving limestone. So far, they've been working with roughly hewn sandstone to build the castle walls. But for more intricate features like arches, windows and stairs, limestone was preferred, as its fine grain meant it was quicker and easier to carve. We need for a chapel tower a lot of stone having 10 inches. inches. First, the boys use their splitting skills to create rough limestone blocks <laughs> under the supervision of stonemason, Abdelilla Abid. The wedge is in. Now you can try the uh, big one. Yeah, the big Perfect. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> The rough block is moved into the mason's lodge onto a platform known as a banker, ready for the skilled job of shaping it. How many? Ten. Yes, very uh, good. <laughs> Decent. You remember. <laughs> Facing a stone was a basic skill that every stonemason would have had. First, the edges are cut using a pitch. And a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> Angle about there. Yes. Yeah. Actually, you have to do it in one time. One time, yeah. One swing through. And you have to, have to follow there now. Like a follow through. OK. Very good. A stonemason would have learnt under the watchful eye of the master mason. I don't want to hear this. <laughs> This is a bird. Tick, 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 tick. The stone mason, it's rhythmical. Yeah. Or quick. But it is always the same. You can do very rhythmical. You only think at the rhythmical music, rhythmical. And a few minutes after, you, it's finished. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Stonemasons were paid per stone carved. So the quicker they worked, the more money they would earn. These limestone blocks are for the chapel tower. This year, the team are hoping to build the walls up by six meters to complete the chapel room itself. In the 13th century, religion was central to daily life, and nearly all castles had a chapel. Here we are. Well, we are in this room. Yeah. And we have to draw the niche in the east part of the room, just in front of us. Yeah. So this drawing you have is, is very much a, a kind of a stylized view, but now as the stonemason, you must precisely mark it out. Yes, exactly. We have now to transform uh, imagination drawing in youthful drawing. The niche is where the altar will be. Before any building is done, the walls must be marked out with absolute precision. OK. This, this is a continuing the curve of this wall. The altar niche must be in the east of the tower. So Florian is marking out the east-west axis using an ingenious medieval tool. I absolutely love this. It's a horn, we cut off the ends. That's been tied to a piece of string, which is wound round an axle, and it is encased in ochre powder. I mean, the, the same ochre that we find in the quarry. When you pull the string up and snap it, it hits the ground, thus shedding the ochre and leaving an absolutely true straight line. And these, they've been around for millennia.
and flip it over. Using just a rope, dividers, and the ochre line, the chapel's walls are marked out. To reach this first floor chapel, a limestone spiral staircase is being built. To design it, Florian and Tom have come to the tracing floor next to the stonemason's lodge. The tracing floor was the nerve center of the medieval building site, where the master mason drew full-scale plans. Bonjour, Bonjour. 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 Using a compass, the circumference of the spiral staircase is drawn, actual size. This is an apprentice job. Always the apprentice, never the master. Florian and Clement are working out the central part of our staircase, and that will form the column that runs up, connecting all the stairs. And now we're going to draw a 12 step. For the medieval mason, geometry was the jewel in the crown of their art. Using just a compass, angles and shapes could be accurately drawn to within a degree with perfect symmetry. Here, Florian divides the circle into six equal segments, which are then subdivided to create 12 steps. Now we have the steps. We can try the steps in the drawing. First. I mean, this is a fantastic way to actually make sure, before you start cutting stone, wasting materials and yeah. time, that they work. You can see there, they're bigger than my foot length, so that's workable. Now we need to finish one step. Because all the steps are the same, Florian needs to make just one template. This is a precision job now. You mess this up, you're going to mess up your stone in the castle. So the last thing to do is basically just cut the template. <laughs> Thank you very much. We've got our template now placed on top of our large piece of stone. We're marking it out with a bit of slate. <laughs> Magic. There it is. Now it's ready. Just cutting. Just, <laughs> just cutting. <laughs> Five, ten minutes. Two or three days. Two or three days. You can hear how good quality this stone is by the ringing sound when Clement hits it. And I think that's why, to be honest, I'm standing here and not actually being allowed to do anything. Ah, I lie. <laughs> right, like. Right, sir. An apprenticeship for a stonemason would have been about seven years. But to be honest, as Clement says, it's actually a lifetime. You're always learning. And Peter and I haven't been here long. And, you know, there's just so much to take in. Carving stone takes its toll on the tools. And every day they must be sharpened uh, by blacksmith draw. Martin Claudel. Is it true, uh, Gedelon, if there's no blacksmith here for two days, work stops? Yes, work stop because uh, we have to fix a lot of stone masonry tools. Yeah. And uh, if we don't do that, they can't work. First, the worn down chisel is heated to 1000 degrees to soften its tip. To reach this temperature, bellows blow air through the fire. I love these bellows. One goes up, the other one goes down. So it's, it's constant airflow, isn't it? Martin draws the chisel to a point on the anvil, then sharpens it using a file. But the chisel tip will be blunt again in no time, unless it's hardened. Hardening is one of the great discoveries of the ancient world, achieved by heating the metal, then quickly quenching it in water. As it gets hot, the metal changes color, and this tells the blacksmith how hard it will be once quenched. Too soft and it won't cut. Too hard and it will shatter. To carve stone, it must get yellow hot. He watches for the colors appearing on the surface of the metal, blue, the red, and most importantly, the straw yellow at the very end. Now, it's 
ready for the Masons. There are a few clues as to how ordinary people lived day to day in a medieval village. But Ruth's pieced together fragments of knowledge to work out how people did the most mundane of everyday tasks, like washing up. I haven't got a scouring pad, but I have got sand. For the pad, well, this time of year there's plenty of fresh grass. I could use straw just as something to rub with. Now, if I've got to deal with grease, that's a different matter altogether. Sand will take the worst of it off, but, you know, I mean, no amount of scrubbing with just some warm water is going to shift the grease out of something. You need a little bit of chemical help. And for that, I turn to wood ash, just straight out the fire. The wood ash combines with water to make caustic soda. When it comes into contact with fat on the dishes, it makes soap, leaving the dishes spotlessly clean. Handful of ash, wipe it round with a bit of grass or straw, rinse it out with hot water, and you get a clean pan. Easy peasy, huh? Knowing what peasants ate in the 13th century is also a challenge. But we do know what ingredients they had to hand. Ruth has come to the castle's garden to see what there is to harvest. Could really do with some TLC, this patch of garden. But nonetheless, a fair few things are starting to sprout through, which is a relief. So I've got parsley coming through here. And a number of other things that you might think of as weeds, and indeed they are weeds, but are edible. There's a lot of land cress with this little white flower on. So that's quite bitter in flavour. But, you know, anything to give a bit of bite. <sighs> Plants that we now consider weeds would also have been used. There's quite a lot of dandelions and nettles too, which will help bulk it out. Wheat and barley were also essential ingredients. Flour was expensive, so workers ground their own, using a device that has been around for 10,000 years. The quern. This is the sound of the past. Oh, a rotary quern like this was estimated to require about an hour to an hour and a half's work every day. This is the daily grind. <laughs> you pop a handful of grain in the centre, barley in this case, and off you go. The posher you were, the more refined your food was. And ordinary people often made do with food that was really quite coarse. And you can see that in people's teeth when we're dug up archaeologically. With the tools sharpened, Clement has put the finishing touches to the step. Now comes the delicate task of transporting it to the chapel. So your step's arriving. <laughs> yeah. Well, I say your step. <laughs> the step is winched up the castle wall, yeah. using only manpower. Ready. So break off. Right, Once on top of the wall. It's moved up the tower using an inclined plane. One slip and the step could fall, wasting three days' work. What do you need, Peter? Rolling. Oh. Be careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three, one. Two. These guys have been doing this for 15 years. So they know how to get things like this up here. But it's amazing what they can move without the use of what, what we call machines, but essentially the use of rollers, levers, inclined planes, pulleys, all made out of wood. Wood and stone working together, perfect harmony. Got like me and Tomo. Do you want to nip down first, Ruth? 
Okay. Each step must be absolutely level, or else the staircase will veer to one side. A mason's level and plumb line are used to ensure it's perfectly positioned. I suppose this staircase has still got quite a long way up to go, isn't it? And if this isn't absolutely perfect, the first little bit of skew, and that just gets magnified as you go up. But carrying anything up here, or, God forbid, fighting your way up here, it'd be really difficult, wouldn't it? Yeah. Tomo's not stuck down there, is he? <laughs> Wedged. Wedged. <laughs> Using the greens from the garden and the ground barley, Ruth is cooking a medieval pottage in the clay pot. So, a little bit of water in there. I'm going to start with my leeks. This time of year, nettles are still quite tender. I wouldn't say that you add nettles for flavour particularly, but they are quite good bulk. They're one of the few things that grows in profusion at this time of year. Let's soften down a bit now. Grain is added to create a porridge-like dish. Hello, Ruth. Oh, you're back. How was it today? It's going very, very well. It's amazing how the whole thing is it's all in two-dimensional layers. But like, then you like see, cuts. yeah, That's a true. third dimension appear, such as the, the, the doorway that we've been working on, put the lintel on there, suddenly, wow. It gives me a real feel, too, of, the, of just how much impact such places must have had mm. on people. You know, if, if everybody's living in, in this sort of little tiny one-room, half in the centre, low building, and then there's that funking great thing out there, it's, it's a, quite a shock to the system, really, isn't it? I mean, it makes a huge... Huge impact. Well, this is a period when these great, like, military buildings, religious buildings are starting to rise up and really make an impact on the landscape. The team are also getting used to the simple medieval food. This is a triumph. This is an absolute triumph. It's... For barley and vegetables, it's not bad. You're a hungry man. You've been pounding all day at the stone, walking on the treadwheel. Anything is good to eat. It's not exactly easy, either, grinding the darn stuff. <laughs> I bet it's just as hard work as pounding away all day at the, in, the, in the quarry. There's no easy jobs in the medieval age. No, there aren't, are they? <laughs> <laughs> Castles dominated the medieval landscape. And Britain has some of the finest in the world. Today, most are decaying relics, many of their secrets buried in time. Now, historian Ruth Goodman Woo! and archaeologists Tom Pinfold and Peter Ginn are turning the clock back to relearn the secrets of the medieval castle builders. This is the ultimate in medieval technology. The origin of our castles is distinctly French, introduced to Britain at the time of the Norman Conquest of 1066. One, two, un, tire! Here in the Burgundy region of France is Guédelon Castle, the world's biggest archaeological experiment. A 25-year project to build a castle from scratch using the same tools, techniques and materials available in the 13th century. It's a lot of hard work at the coalface because this is industry. For the next six months, Ruth, Peter and Tom will experience the daily rigors of medieval construction. Drop down. Yeah. Yep. And everyday life. How workers dressed and ate. You can really smell your food, Ruth. <laughs> and the art of combat. Oh. This is the story of how to build a medieval castle. It's April, and since their arrival a month ago, the team have been learning ancient skills from the Gedelon Masons. 
Perfect. Oh, good. <laughs> They've also set up a base for themselves in the shadow of the castle. Building a castle involves such a lot of people, and they've all got to live somewhere. The 13th century was part of the golden age of castle building, when ever-evolving tactics and fortifications were driven by the legacy of bloody crusades and vicious dynastic struggles. Medieval dynasties sought to expand their influence and protect their gains. They built imposing stone castles, not only to assert power, but more fundamentally, to withstand attack. Now the team learn about building the castle's defensive structures. They look at the ingenious features medieval castle builders devised. And explore the craft behind the weapons they had to resist. Defence for me really is the raison d'etre of a castle. It's not just you know, the battles, the attacking, the defending, it's the structural input that you have to think about, your defensive, your curtain walls, your towers, things like that. They are defensive structures, I suppose. I mean, they're much more than that, though, aren't they? I mean, they are about defending yourself psychologically. They're about telling everybody, don't even try it. And what about the weapons, too? I mean, what could they actually do against a castle? How effective were they? Yeah. I guess, how many men do you need to defend a castle? And you can... need some ruddy, great big stores of food. <laughs> <laughs> and castles, you know, people sometimes, you know, knights and princesses, but it isn't. It's mostly about the likes of us, isn't it? It's about everybody else. And yeah. how do we survive? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a castle like this at Gedelon would have been built for a prosperous lord who wanted to display his wealth and power, and also needed his home to be strong enough to withstand potential attack. And this dictates much of its design, with 36 feet high curtain walls protecting the courtyard and residential spaces. Entry is via a twin-towered gatehouse, and at each corner above the crenellated walls, there will be four round towers the highest of which will be the Great Tower, a superb vantage point at nearly 100 feet high. In charge of the defensive structure of the castle is Master Mason, Florian Renucci. He's traveled the world studying the ancient secrets behind medieval stonework. Yedelon's walls are over 12 feet thick in places. Today, the masons are placing a special long stone, called a butis, into a section of castle wall, designed specifically to reinforce it against attack. The butis is to connect the front of the wall, yeah. front part, to the, uh, the stone inside the wall. Right. Uh, the butis, for instance, you have one here. This stone here is very long, it's here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can and see that. yeah. We have to have a wall really um, strong. Yeah. This wall has to resist an enemy. Yeah. And a better way to fight a castle yeah. is to throw stone <laughs> to the wall. Yeah. If we don't put booties, the front part of the wall will go down. You can really see from this wall that you've got the external face, the internal face, and the bit in the middle, the, the infill. Exactly. We are going to put one British. Can you help us? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Very good. You can use strong, Peter. I don't need to. That's, <laughs> that's the beauty yes. of this. Yes, uh, try to be always in the middle of the stone. Right. right. It's a heavy yeah. stone to have a strong castle. Booty stones are not just placed at random. They're fixed into the wall at three feet intervals to give maximum strength. The booties go in the middle right. of the joint. So it's just linking in. 
but it's so clever because the pressure is now spread between two stones. Yes, we have to think everything. It's like um, um, a game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like medieval Tetris. At Gedelon, they're using a medieval formula to make mortar, mixing water with quarry sand and lime putty. Unlike lime produced industrially, it will take many centuries to set completely. We were afraid about it. Because thousands of tons of stone being held together, it was a bit of a risk at the start then. Exactly. And uh, it's perhaps the first time in Gedelon that we use this old way of making mortar. Through experimentation, they've discovered that clay impurities in the quarry sand give this mortar great strength. So the experimental archaeology has actually given you a really good building substance to build your castle. Exactly. Uh, Tom's just putting the mortar down here, and he's making it rough. So when the stone goes down, that mortar will press into the, the cracks of the stone. If it was smooth, then you just have gaps. So if there's a bump in the stone and smooth mortar, it, it just wouldn't touch it. Whereas because he's making it all rough, it will squidge together and just keep that stone absolutely solidly fixed into place. It's looking good, Tom. Every stone has to be in line because this is going to go up and up and up, potentially another four metres. These stones are slightly off, your build is slightly off, and eventually it will collapse. Now the stone will be... Solid. Solid. The biggest threat to castles were sieges. These were far more common than pitched battles and could last for months, even years. If they couldn't get through the gates, invaders could try going over the walls with towers and ladders or mining under them. But another, more sophisticated means of attack developed. From basic stone throwers to mangonels, cuillard and trebuchet, a range of deadly medieval war machines evolved. These came to dominate siege warfare for hundreds of years until they were ultimately superseded by the cannon. The largest ever trebuchet, it is thought, was that commissioned by Edward Longshanks, King of England, in the War of Scottish Independence. And he was trying to bring down Stirling Castle. It was a vast beast called Warwolf, as a nickname. Disassembled, it took 30 wagons to move it. Five master carpenters worked on it, along with 49 other workers. And it could hurl an object of 300 pounds weight with accuracy. 30 miles from Guédelon is Saint-Brisson Castle, which houses a collection of replica siege engines. The Romans introduced basic catapults to Britain. But by the 13th century, the development of counterweight technology saw the introduction of deadly, high-powered stone-hurling war machines. They were used in sieges to bombard defending troops and collapse castle walls. The crew wear protective helmets in case the machine malfunctions. How big do you think that counterweight is? How's it going, Tom? It's good, mate. It's amazing how only four people can manoeuvre such a heavy counterweight. Yeah, I mean, what? that's about 500 kilograms. The energy you're putting into that to raise it up is going to be stored as potential energy. And then when it's released, this, which is about 10 kilograms, this ball is going to be swung out and flung into the distance. And they reckon it'll go about 100 metres. Looking good. Right, he's just going to lock this off. There we go. Tension's on the pin. Now it's locked off, they can unwind this rope so that when it fires, or when it's loosed, the rope doesn't hold it back. So here we go, unwinding the rope. 
Whoa, watch those handles. I mean, this is a well-trained crew. They know what they're doing. I mean, this is uh, it's, uh, very different, isn't it, from doing it in peacetime as it would be in the heat of battle. That's the thing about the shouting, the noise. Yeah. These ropes can snap, the wood can snap. Here we go. The ball, the projectile, into the sling, and it's ready to go. So we're standing back. <laughs> standing <Okay>. back. <laughs> so we're just moving back. Go to the seclusion zone. I imagine if it was in the heat of battle, <laughs> you'd just be there. Yeah. yeah. You'd feel quite lonely if you were the guy who's about to pull the rope. Right, we're going to count down. Cinq, quatre, trois, deux, un, tirez! You still, look how much energy okay, is still yeah. in there. And you have to get the mathematics absolutely right. The difference between the length of that arm and the length of the rope and the things. If you don't get that spot on, it can fly backwards instead of flying forwards. But if you, de <laughs> if you deconstruct this, it's essentially scaffolding. It's a, it's a mason shape. It ball. is. It's the ropes. That and it's exactly site. the same mathematics yeah. that the masons are using. Yeah. I mean, it's really, it's sort of simple, but it's also really yeah. quite sophisticated. If you can build a castle, you can fight a castle. Well, that's the arms race that's happening in our period, isn't it? Now, the castles get more strong, more developed, more technical, and so the siege weapons become stronger, more powerful, more technical. Yeah. Each driving each other further and further onwards. It's not fast, though, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Despite being slow, these mighty war machines were greatly feared in the Middle Ages. Some fortified towns surrendered at the very sight of them. All right. Shall we go and have a look? Projectiles ranged from carved stone or mortar balls like these to rotting animal carcasses intended to spread disease and even the heads of defeated soldiers to really lower morale. It's funny, isn't it, looking at the damage, you know, because it is just a small hole. But I suppose when you think again against a stone wall, it's, it's going to keep going until it finds a weakness. This is one the hammer, after isn't another. it? Yeah. Yeah, a hammer doesn't crack It's not a great with one explosion, blow. it's. The persistent drip, drip, drip until you crack. As well as being an archaeologist, Tom is a midshipman in the Royal Naval Reserve with a special interest in military history. He's been looking into what kind of armour an ordinary soldier might have worn in the 1200s. Not everyone could afford the expensive metal helmets and mail worn by wealthy lords and knights. A more basic form of protection commonly worn for combat was the gambeson, a padded linen tunic whose main protective element was sheep's wool. Tom's visiting Ruth in the hovel. She wants to make him a gambeson, and the process starts with the sheep's wool. Ruth, when you asked me here for a fitting for my protective clothing, <laughs> I was thinking chainmail and armour. That's not the case, is it? No, no, no. This is well, it is, but it's not. This is cloth armour. Cloth armour. Yeah. And that's good, is it? It is good. Yeah, you're uh. going to be glad of this, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> so you may have lots and lots and lots of layers of linen, and then a big fat layer of wool, prepared wool, and then more and more and more layers, many and then you've got to stitch the whole lot together really tight. Not so it's like big and fluffy like a duvet. Right, but compacted down. Compacted right down into something truly dense. I mean, it's almost, this is, modern bodily armour is the evolution from this. You have yeah. still that balance between protection and manoeuvrability and trying to cover as much of the body as possible. And this is the ancestor of Kevlar, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of the bulletproof <laughs> vest. Here he 
here, guys. One of the defining visual features of medieval castles is their arrow loops. The ingenious design of these simple slits in the walls provided protection and gave castle archers a huge advantage. Very good. Gedelon Mason, Constantin Lemel, has specially shaped a stone needed for building an arrow loop in a corner tower. Before they mortar the stone in place, they need to be sure it fits. Right, so that's in position. I thought that was going to go the other way around, actually. I thought... Uh, no, uh, yeah. we have to alternate. We have to, to, to have a, a long face here and after a yeah. short one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and when you have a short one, you have a long here yeah. and a short under. It's to, to get something uh, very stronger when you cross uh, the, the stones. Yeah, OK. The funnel-shaped design of the arrow loop, tapering to a mere three-inch gap, gave attackers outside only a tiny slit to aim at while the defenders could look out without being seen. The arrow loop sloped down, so archers could see invaders, even at the foot of the tower. If it was um, like this, for instance, yeah, we can't right. uh, can hit people uh, over uh, there. fight and, and shoot people. So people, got step ladder. So, <laughs> so people can be uh, in front of the tower, no problem for them. Completely yeah. safe. I guess also this is a weak point of the castle, isn't it? You're actually creating a crack in your castle wall, so you need to reinforce it. People said that in the 13th century, the round tower was very useful to resist when stones are throwing on, on the tower. Because when the stones are coming, the, the round form um, used to be stronger. I guess you spread the pressure, don't you? If the stone hits there and it's curved, then all these other stones exactly. take the impact. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Peter and I are probably firing arrows out. We just break our arrows on the inside, so... Of course, it'll be interesting to see if you fire an arrow or a bolt back in. That's it. That's the trick, isn't it? If you're yeah. attacking, you want to be able to know, you at least scare people, if not kill them, <laughs> on the inside. <laughs> There'll be around 40 arrow loops in the finished castle. In order to test their effectiveness, Peter and Tom will need a suitable weapon. One of the most infamous at the time was the crossbow. First seen in 4th century BC China, by the 1200s, crossbows were increasingly used in European siege warfare. Crossbows were probably introduced into Britain around the time of the Norman Conquest. In some ways, they were less effective than the longbows. They took an awful lot longer to load, so the rate of fire was much, much slower. Out in the battlefield, in the heat of the moment, they were pretty useless. But in a siege, it was a completely different thing. Behind some nice, safe walls, you had time. And it was the sort of weapon that anybody could use with no training and no skill at all. Richard the Lionheart eventually met his end when a crossbow bolt fired by a boy in 1199 pierced him in the shoulder. The resulting infection did for him. As a weapon that made knights more vulnerable to lowly foot soldiers, some despised it for breaking the conventions of chivalry. But the art of crossbow making became a whole industry by the 13th century. In Britain, it survives to this day among a few specialist craftsmen, like bowyer Chris Jury. This is what's going to be known as the crossbow prod, which is basically the, the bow on a crossbow. What kind of wood is this? This is yew wood. Now, yew wood is probably the best wood for making a bow. In any piece of yew, you get the, the sap wood and the heartwood. The sapwood is good in tension, which means it can stretch, and the heartwood is good in compression, which means it can crush. 
so the two grow naturally together in a single piece of wood to form uh, a natural spring. Chris uses a spoke shave to take off the bark. I would imagine in the medieval period they would have done it in like a production process, so it would be done in, in fairly large batches. Apprentices would have started off maybe the sort of age of 13, 14. After seven years, then you was a journeyman. He was, he was nearly at the point where he was a master of the craft. Then you'd be a master bow maker. And by that time, you wouldn't even get your hands dirty with the making of the bows. <laughs> you'd just let your minions get on and do it for you, basically. So as I am your apprentice, uh -huh. is there any chance I can have a go with that? Yeah, of course you can, yes. You want to be gentle, but you've always got to put a bit of pressure on it. It is, yeah, it's quite a delicate task because you don't want to be cutting into the sapwood at all. You just want to remove the bark. Taking off lumps there. <laughs> don't, to... look. Uh... don't look, don't <laughs> look. I'll, I'll start down. The next stage is to taper the prod with an axe. Yeah, I can tell you use an axe before. You've definitely got a, a better technique than that with a spoke shape. <laughs> you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> well, the more we do this, the more likely it is that I'm going to make a mistake. So. <laughs> you need all ten toes, do you? Yeah, you take one of your own legs. <laughs> Gone. That's it, that's good, that's good. Yeah, a bit of aggression is okay. Yeah, that's it, gone. A draw knife is used to further smooth and shape the crossbow that's prod. It, it in. That's it, it's still way too thick, so you can take off a lot of wood. I suppose, like with everything, it's just about getting your eye in, understanding the material you're working with and understanding the tools, and hopefully, it all comes together. Yes, that's why certain tools like the axe. And like the spoke shape and the draw knife are ideal because they follow the grain. So while the tools look a bit crude, they actually do the job rather well. But you can understand how the apprentices did seven years because it's quite a it's quite a specialist kind of task really. So it's a, yeah, that's starting to take shape rather nicely. If you've done good work with your tapers, then it should bend relatively evenly. Well, I think I've done uh, exceptional work with my taper. Well, so. it, 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 <laughs> it, well, it looks it looks pretty good. Carpenter Sam Rooney has come all the way from New Zealand to work at Gedelon. In his spare time, he makes traditional bows. Today, Sam and Ruth are experimenting with making a crossbow arrow, known as a bolt or quarrel, which was shorter, heavier, and more deadly than a regular arrow. You imagine an arrow, whether it be for a crossbow or, or a longbow, and you imagine a little stick. Yeah. Why are you starting with a great big piece of wood? Mainly for mass producing arrows. You can have several lengths of a tree and then just split it into small squares. So I suppose, yes, I suppose if you think really mass production, that makes sense, doesn't it? If you've got to make 20,000 yeah. for a castle, yeah. the amount of time it would take, take you to time. find yeah. 20,000 sticks that were yeah. the right size and shape. You have to send an army of people <laughs> off to gather twigs. Yeah, yeah. Right. whereas two or three trees would do you your 20,000 arrows. Yeah. Right, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. <laughs> You're just squaring this off at the moment, are you? Yeah, I'm just squaring it off right. using a, uh, a medieval bandsaw. The thin piece of wood is then cut into individual strips, which will be shaped to make each bolt shaft. And it'll yeah. be practically a Keep circle, yeah. like this one here. All right, so yeah. that one's pretty much finished. Yeah, that's about as round as you're going to need yeah. it, isn't it? So we're going to drill a small hole in the end of the bolt. A metal bolt head is then attached. You would not want that pushed through you, would you? Oh, no. that foul looking <laughs> thing. And the slit is cut so it can be fletched. It's recorded that in 1250, a chief English quarrel maker produced 25,000 quarrels a year and could be expected to make 100 in a single day. It is a it huge amount of work, all of this, isn't it? 
Well, yeah, I guess so. Bows are still really woven into our modern life. I mean, think of the surnames. Bowyer, Fletcher, Stringer, Archer. And then all the number of phrases that come from one form of archery or another, things like to pick a quarrel or a bolt from the blue or he's got lots of strings to his bow. They're all archery terms. They finish off their bolt by warming up a medieval glue made from an unusual source. It's made from the bladder of a fish. But you actually like get the bladder and dry it out. Show a bit of glue in here. So it's Lighten just a bit of glue so. on the leather, yeah, shove it in the here. slot. Yeah. <laughs> there That's it. Yeah. There we go, one quarrel. Well, thanks very much. I shall um, give it a go. OK, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> thanks, Sam. Mm. By the end of the 12th century, a new design of crossbow was introduced. The addition of a metal stirrup enabled the crossbowman to hold the bow with his foot and draw back the string, either with both hands or a belt hook. This was known as spanning the bow. Peter has come to make the stirrup with Martin Claudel, who's been a blacksmith at Gedelon for four years. And they use a process called smith and striking. The smith is the blacksmith, he's the guy doing the thinking. He's got the little hammer, he's moving the metal around, he taps it. The striker has the big hammer, and that is me. I always hate doing the striking. I'm not, I've got no rhythm, basically. But then he hits, I hit, he hits, I hit, and when he hits the anvil, I stop. OK, we good? And, uh... You're done. All oh, right. Peter and Martin will hammer the iron flat and then bend it at four corners, making a stirrup shape. I, th I think we got away with that. Um, it's certainly starting to take shape. We've got a, we got a, we got a kink in it, we've got a bend. And in these two ends, he's going to fire weld. So he's, he's basically splitting the metal. So when they come together, they interlock. He'll heat all that up, and then he'll basically smack it as hard as he can and compact that back into a single piece of metal, essentially creating a fire weld, which is ultimately very, very strong. Which will give it the strength it needs, because if you think about putting your foot in it and pulling on that crossbow in order to cock it, you don't want your metal coming apart. He's going to ramp up the heat so it goes white hot. The reason for the darkness in here is so he can see the colours. Here we go. That's fantastic. Are you yeah. happy? I'm happy. Yeah. Back at the hovel, Ruth has enlisted some help to stitch Tom's gambeson together. Hello. Oh, hi, chaps. Oh, oh dear. Hello. What are these? You're making rugs or something, are you? <laughs> uh, you told me they were making you a suit of armour. <laughs> <laughs> we are. Very, really? very, very slowly. That's the first uh, layers of cloth all sewn together with the wool going on top. Yeah. And then I've started quilting this panel. I'll so it's like a front piece and a back piece? Yeah. yeah. And then as soon as you start sewing, you can see it's starting to compress it down. Look, have yeah. a feel of the difference of that. Look, how wobbly that is, soft and wobbly. Yeah. And then feel where it is when it's sewn. Oh, wow. I well, think so. It's nice so. to be fighting the winter, because this looks 
quite warm. <laughs> I think it's quite warm. Mm. And in fact, I have to be honest, don't fight any time soon. You will believe <laughs> this is a day's work. I mean, I've done nothing all day today except this. Well, who's wearing gambesons? They've been worn by um, men at arms, fairly ordinary soldiers, you know, yeah. uh, and being worn by the rich soldiers in combination with chainmail. Mm. So they've been worn by quite a lot of people. Yeah, I'd certainly be happier if I was on the walls wearing a gambeson to sort of stand there with my crossbow than I would be if I'd yeah, just... Yeah, I don't shirt. know. <laughs> In the 13th century, gambeson making was a skilled craft done mainly by men. You keep your right arm underneath, so you just keep poking and pointing. And I find if you stretch the cloth with your left hand... Blimey. Yeah, blimey, I'm glad you said that. Now you've missed, look, you've gone come up right over there. Don't want to go back down. Yeah, you've got to come up in line. OK, OK. He's not a natural, is he? At least I'm giving it a go, eh? At least you're giving it a go. <laughs> no, no, missed try again. again. Oh. <laughs> this is like pot luck. Right, this time. OK. That's better. That'll do, that'll do. It's good enough. Right. Yeah. And you need to pull really tight, though don't break the thread. Yeah. Marvellous. And then straight back down again. Straight back down. That's it. And catch you with the other arm. Do not envy you. One eye It item. is slow, isn't it? It is. Chris is nearing the final stages of his work on the crossbow. OK, so here we have your bow, all nicely shaped and uh, expertly tapered <laughs> and nice and smooth. Um, and now the next stage is to make sure it bends evenly. The prod is ready to be put under tension using a tiller stick. If the bow is not evenly shaped, the prod may snap. So now we're basically examining the curve of the bow. Right. So the, tr the <laughs> yeah. trick is you need to spot the weak bits before they develop into a problem and shave them away. So even after all this time and all this work, there's still actually jeopardy about whether it'll actually there's be a massive, effective. There's a massive amount of jeopardy involved in doing it. This is the real art of the bow. You need to train your eye to see the curve and to notice any flat spots in the curve. Yeah, I was going to say, because to be honest, it looks pretty good to me. So we're happy with that. That'll make a good shooting bow. Deep ditch and sloped walls at the base of the castle are designed to make them harder to approach. The only entrance across the ditch is a 10 foot high bridge to the main gate. A structure which relies on a very humble element to hold it together the nail. Six hundred and seventy seven were needed to make this bridge all forged on site. Martin the blacksmith makes all the nails for the doors and fixtures in the castle. Inspired by a popular story from the Middle Ages, Ruth has come to the blacksmith's forge. I'm going to have a go at making a nail. This, believe it or not, is a really female activity. The story goes that when they needed the nails to crucify Christ, the blacksmith that they asked refused to be involved. And his wife stepped up. I'll make them, she said. <laughs> it was a story that had a lot of popularity in the 13th century. And as a result, there are lots and lots of pictures of women working at a blacksmith's forge, nail making. Frequently rather ugly, demonized women. Great big hook noses. But dressed just like me. This one little piece of metal that we're working, how many nails will it make? Maybe between 10 and uh, 20, maybe. It's not many, is it, for this not much many. work? <laughs> 
I mean, I suppose that really explains why things like furniture are made entirely with, with no nails. They're all made of wood with wood joints. So you only use your nails where you really need them. It's a, it's a precious thing for me. It's a funny thing that when you talk about the past and you list all the crafts, people imagine that that means it's only men. If you look at the lists of guilds people in London and indeed in Paris, it's amazing how many crafts are in fact headed up by a female name. There were female blacksmiths. Once the iron has turned red in the hearth, it softens and can be worked. Almost ready. Almost ready. Ruth is going to try smith and striking with Marta. I can scarcely lift this hammer, let alone do anything useful with it. We'll see. Scary moment. <laughs> I got a block of wood to stand on because I'm short. Oh, sorry. I'm not on strike, am I? Oh, terrible. My hips are not quite central, and so I'm making dents down the edges, and he's being very... <laughs> sorting out all my... Mm. The metal is heated again and again. Nice and sharp on the end. And gradually driven into a point before being squared up. The head is then shaped. That's it. And just straightened out. And plunged in the water to cool it. Just like that. I can really see why. 13th century, people were finding ways of using as few nails as possible. Such a lot of work. The stirrup is in a fairly straight line. To make the finished weapon, crossbow expert Robin Knight binds Peter's iron stirrup and Tom's U prod. I mean, one of the interesting things for me about making this crossbow is you're relying on a lot of different skills. You know, a well, blacksmith was, making a stirrup, a yeah, bowyer making was, the... There was no such thing as a crossbow maker. One man made the tiller, the blacksmith made all of the ironwork, another man made the string. That's where you get the surname Stringer. When the, the guy at the end of the process got all the bits together, he didn't know how each individual part was made because to him, and they, the, the trades were, before the guilds, were called mysteries. To him, it was a mystery. Right, it that's just, simple. <laughs> he just wasn't aware of how it was done. Group of individuals with very specific knowledge and skills. Exactly. Bringing together almost like a, a flat pack of a crossbow, and then one yeah. man... one man put it together. Now, what separates the crossbow from the longbow is really in defence, you don't actually need a huge amount of strength or skill or to use it. Can use training, it for, training for long bows took from about the age of seven. Crossbowman, you can train him up in half a day. But he's still got the capability of killing you with half a day's training as a longbowman with 15 years training. I mean, this is a weapon that but was actually the, the, banned by the church, wasn't it? Was a that? weapon unfit to be used on Christians, only to be used on heathens and Saracens. Nobody likes crossbows. Unfortunately, you get the odd bulls like me that sort of quite like them. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now we come to the crunch. We're going to span the bow. Moment of truth. Mo the moment of truth. Now, Stir it works. Get your foot in there. OK, is everybody 
Holy mother. So that, looks, that looks pretty good, doesn't it? It looks solid. It's a proper piece of killing machinery, that. Back at the castle, the team are almost ready for basic siege combat. Look at you two relaxing. <laughs> I've been away working. <laughs> this is it. There's your stirrup, mate. I'll come in between you if that's all right. Looks pretty good. Are you surprised? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I'll be honest, it wasn't me that did most of it. <laughs> this is our medieval killing oh, machine. Got the, got the other that's, bit. that's quite a long trigger there. It's a long trigger. Oh, wow. And you... that's our ammunition, is it? Oh. OK. Yeah, it looks quite deadly. Oh, that's, that doesn't looks know, horrible, does it doesn't it? What do you think? If you've dipped that in you know, some animal dung or something like that, you've actually got a biological weapon there as well. Mm. You're going to infect. So, and even if you don't kill them straight off, yeah. you're going to do damage. It's not a nice weapon. Is there any such thing? Well, very true, very true. So, Ruth, how is uh, Tomo's Gambeson coming <laughs> off? Well, it's not finished, I can tell you is that. It, that's it there, is it? <laughs> yeah, where's the front panel? I've got that's, it sort of shaped and... That's looking pretty mostly good. Mostly bound. It's a, it's a pretty rigid beast. Oh. Have I got the right shape? It's quite heavy. Ooh. Oh! oh. <laughs> that's oh come on, come on, get you, get you. Oh, blimey. So how much more work is there to well, do Well, I'm going to do the back panel. You're not getting sleeves. I've given up on uh, sleeves. Initially, I was going to plan you the proper full gambeson with the sleeves, but I'm sorry. I think it would be a bit like a straitjacket if had <laughs> sleeves, but... I found an bank. ancient <laughs> gambeson that's at the end of its life. Oh. If you want to try a complete one on. But... Put one on Peter. Oh, no. I told you it was a bit smelly <laughs> and ancient, didn't I? This is classic gin. It's smelly. Oh, it might, <laughs> might actually be alive. It smells like this. a tent, that. It's like a straight jacket, yeah. doesn't Arms it? Arms out. See, look how much softer this one is than, than the other one. This is much more <laughs> flexible. I quite like mine, to be honest. I like the cleanness of mine. Cleanness. Let's oh, do me up. It is like a straight jacket. You start at the top, do you? Shall I hold it across? Yeah. You could just imagine some chaps trying to get into all this lot in a hurry, can't you? <laughs> it's a real team effort, isn't it, actually? <laughs> <laughs> they are. Got another lot to do. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Yes, this is... Seats you. It's pretty good. Not pretty just good. sustaining. You feel strong? Yeah. <laughs> You've got a few little weak points. It's going to protect. Those who could afford it would have covered their gambeson with a chainmail shirt weighing over 25 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> if there's only one way of doing this. Oh, no, this is like... Right hand to the right piece. Oh, my hair's stuck in it. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have a ball stop by the time I get out of here. Can you get in? Oh, we've lost a sleeve on this <laughs> side. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's so glamorous. Here we, we go. Pull your sleeve up. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Oh, How's yeah. your movement now? I mean, you see, it's a it's bit... It's good. It's a it, bit more restrictive it's, under the arms. It's actually not it? that restrictive. It's just the weight, you it know. Is it heavy. is it's heavy. It's really heavy. But it's not that heavy. I can still... Do oh, oh, oh. You see the chain mail on, it actually looks like it would give you better protection than I thought originally against yeah, something like this. It is this. quite dense, isn't it? That's fine. That is actually... That's actually fine. <laughs> I'll take a run up. Close contact. You're going to be yeah. pretty safe from a sword blow, aren't you, in that? Yeah. Now we get to see him taking that off. <laughs> We're not going to help him then. No. Oh, sorry, Peter. No, no, this is going to be the amusing moment. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I've seen, some, I've seen some wonderful period images of blokes trying to get out of their, their male shirts. Go on. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> the years I spent in the asylum. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what the pictures show. This is exactly what they show. <laughs> Unbelievable. Whey! <laughs> wow, that's a weight off your shoulders. The team are going to give the Gambeson a sterner test using their new crossbow.
I can't tell you how glad I'm not really in the 13th yeah. century facing an invading yeah, army. Already. I just can't imagine how horrible that would be. Boats shot from a high-powered crossbow could be as deadly as bullets and shell fire. OK, you can duck down so you can rest. Hide. Thumbs on there. Oh, I okay. wish it looked less like a person. <laughs> <laughs> There's no head. Oh, okay. it's horrible. Here no, there is. It's very, very small. <laughs> <laughs> OK, here we go. OK. Three, two, one. Ah, thank goodness for that, I missed. <laughs> Load you up, big boy. <laughs> You're below that. Toi, de, uh, uh. Nice. You meanie. You <laughs> yeah. meanie. Well, I've gone to the side and low. Yeah, yeah. Should we have a look? Yeah. How are we <laughs> looking? How? Well, it has gone through. It's gone through, is it? That okay, much. Yeah. I really right. expected that to be, you know, up to the Yeah, up to the I flight. thought it was going to be <laughs> spaded into you, yeah. But let's not forget the, uh, the quality of the gambeson. You know, that layered approach has obviously worked. While some sieges were won by overpowering the castle, it was often something far more basic, which finally forced the defenders to surrender. In truth, when castles fell, it was rarely to actual siege engines and far more frequently to starvation. Indeed, in 1215 at Rochester, besieged inside the castle, the people were holding out. King John, on the outside, had amassed five trebuchets that were battering the walls for two months. Inside, food was running short, and they looked around them and began to eat their expensive war horses. And it was only when they had finished eating every horse that they surrendered. Defending your food was a vital aspect of strategic castle design. With this in mind, Gedelon's great tower contains its own food store and a well. It's the castle's ultimate stronghold. If the walls were breached, it would be possible to fall back to the great tower. Next to the great tower is the kitchen, where Ruth begins preparing a meal fit for fighting men. Meanwhile, Peter and Tom are about to put the arrow loops of the Great Tower to the test. That's quite a narrow target, isn't it, really? Yeah. You know, I mean, do you ever really aim to hit someone on the other side, or are you just trying to get the bolts out the gap? Can't actually see much out of there. I guess there's only one thing to do. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> are you aiming for anything out there, or are you just...? Just aiming for the gap, my friend. Aiming for the gap. Right, bolts in, touching string. OK. That was fast. In this environment, that seemed far more powerful and these a lot faster. Well, I guess from a defensive point of view, then, something like that, shooting out the, the loop, you know, it's a bit of a fear factor straight away, isn't it? Satisfied with the defensive capacity of Gedelon's arrow loops on the inside, Tom and Peter set about seeing how resistant they are to attack from the outside. Do you think... We can get a, a bolt through that gap. Luckily, we're not under fire. Um, we're not uh, having rocks thrown at us. I reckon we could definitely do it in six. Should we give it a go then? Yeah, let's give it a go. Okay. So you're going to load for me? I'll load. Arrow in the groove. It's on the string. 
Oh, that was terrible, that no, it wasn't. After many attempts, a shot finally finds its target. Yes! A feat that would be somewhat harder to achieve in the heat of battle. <laughs> that, no, that was lucky. <laughs> well, still. I mean, that was a good height on there as well. That would have gone in about head height inside. Yeah. Architecturally, these arrow loops, they work for this castle, don't they? You can be in there, you can fire out, but if you're outside here, trying to fire in, it's not impossible, but it's, it's, it's lucky if you do. While Peter and Tom return to the building work, in the castle kitchen, Ruth is preparing food for medieval men at arms. It is slightly conjectural. We have to sort of look at as many sources as we can to come up with what a 13th century soldier would actually be eating. So it largely comes down to pork. Pork was considered to be the food which was most compatible with the human body. Medieval thinking was that the body of someone of high social standing digested and responded to food differently to that of a common man. So their food needed to be cooked differently. For the common soldiery, it just all goes in. Fat, skin, marrow, all good for building strong fighting bodies. This broth or pottage simply contains pork, onions, beans and some herbs. So that should just quietly cook for the next couple of hours. So almost the same ingredients, pork, the beans and the onions are also going to form the basis of dish suitable for the Lord. But it is the cooking methods that make the difference. 13th century medical and ideas thought of the stomach as a cauldron that had to cook through the food. They thought that by cooking food itself, you could be helping the stomach to do that process. So for the Lord, we start by boiling the meat. It's parboiled, part cooked by boiling it. Then we roast it, which is the stage I've reached here. And then, once it's mostly roasted, it's going to come off the spit again, cut up, and then fried lightly. So this is still running a little bit pink. Done to a turn, as they say. Meaning, to within one turn of the spit. Which is exactly what I want, ready for this last quick flash fry. Although we call it frying, it's more like sort of braising. I shan't give it long. About two minutes, and it'll be done. And that, with the beans and a sprinkle of dandelion leaves, should make him one of the most fearsome warriors in Christendom. It's nearly time to down tools at the end of the day. But first, there's a special delivery to the top of the tower. Oh, you can really smell your food, Ruth. <laughs> what have oh, you I got for us? Smoke. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> right on cue. Oh, pass it. All right. Crockery. Crockery. Fried onions. Fried onions. Tomo's food. Beans. My food. Oh, pork. A nicely food. balanced diet, then. Oh, yeah. So, you know, where do you fancy yourself on the social scale, really? Well, I know where I am on the <laughs> yeah. social scale. <laughs> <laughs> I'm roughing it at the moment. But... Oh, and by the way, dandelion petals, they are associated with the planet Mars. Hey, so really? you're going to be that martial by the time oh. you're finished. Ah, That's the point. I see. Yeah? So we're going to start with... I'll start with a bit of yeah. pottage. Some man-of-arms. Yeah. yeah. 
I know you're a man. <laughs> you <laughs> you start in a bit of work. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll eat this and I'll start working. <laughs> I'm going to I'm I'm next bit of that thrice yeah. cooked pork. <laughs> Anyway, it would all look more lovely, up. wouldn't it, if it was on silver platters <laughs> and they were beautiful napkins and so forth, but never mind. It's got, it's got that rustic look to it. Yeah, I'm good at rustic. I don't really do posh, pretty food. But if you're up on the walls doing guard duty, <coughs> reckon you actually want the kind of pottage, almost stew-type meal. You can just, you know, you don't have to think about it. You can just enjoy your food. Yeah, it's going to warm you up. Of course, I suppose, you know, if you're in a castle, this is a great meal on day one of the siege. <laughs> but <laughs> by day four, you're starting to look at the stocks and say, hey, how, how much have we got? And as it drags on. As much as anything, food is a weapon of war. Yeah. Exactly. Castles dominated the medieval landscape. And Britain has some of the finest in the world. Today, most are decaying relics many of their secrets buried in time. Now, historian Ruth Goodman and archaeologists Tom Pinfold and Peter Ginn are turning the clock back to relearn the secrets of the medieval castle builders. This is the ultimate in medieval technology. The origin of our castles is distinctly French introduced to Britain at the time of the Norman Conquest of 1066. One, two, one, tire! Here in the Burgundy region of France is Guédelon Castle, the world's biggest archaeological experiment. A 25-year project to build a castle from scratch, using the same tools, techniques, and materials available in the 13th century. It's a lot of hard work at the coalface, because this is industry. For the next six months, Ruth, Peter, and Tom will experience the daily rigors of medieval construction. Drop down. Yeah. Yep. And everyday life. Looking really good, you know. How workers dressed oh. and ate. You can really smell your food, Ruth. <laughs> and the art of combat. This is the story of how to build a medieval castle. It's May, and the team have been immersed in the building works alongside Gedelon's masons. Perfect. I get it. They've learned how the castle was defended in times of war. Every stone has to be in line because this is going to go up and up and up. Now the team discover the surprisingly colourful world of 13th century castle interiors. And much of the material they work with will come straight from the ground. Some of the stuff in here is ochre. From paint to brighten the rooms. It's hot. Look at the difference on my <laughs> fingers. To turning mud into floor tiles. Can you imagine living in a world with no electric lights? And they'll be rediscovering an ancient art in a midnight firing at the kiln. The medieval castles we're used to seeing today are scarred by centuries of warfare and weather erosion. Most of their original roofs, carpentry and interior finishes have long since disappeared. But these drab walls are a far cry from how they looked in their heyday. This is how many of us think of the interior of castles. Bare stone, echoey, damp, gritty underfoot, but that's because we're used to ruins. When they were in use back in the 13th century, they were rather different. 
You have to imagine tiled floors and plaster on the walls, perhaps painted, whitewashed, and then hangings of fabric over the top, filled with furniture. And that too is covered in fabrics, cushions, all sorts, an entirely different beast. To strive for accuracy, the Gedalon project has adopted a specific historical time frame to work to. The castle is being designed and built as it would have been in the France of the 1230s and 40s, during the reign of King Louis IX. The region of Puisé in Burgundy was governed by one Jean de Toussy, a vassal to the king. In turn, de Toussy was the overlord of several other lower-ranking noblemen. And it was one of these lesser nobles who would have commissioned a castle like the one being built here at Guédelon today. It's not a grand royal castle, bristling with military might and enormous wealth, but a fortified residence of relatively modest taste and design, according to the rank and means of the imaginary lord of Guédelon. The team, along with site administrator Sarah Preston, are exploring some of the key rooms and quarters within the castle to find out how the interiors are being dressed. This is the castle's great hall. Great is the word. So this is very much the, the hub of castle life. This is, it's a dining hall, it's a, it's a banqueting, feasting hall. I mean, this room is a statement of power and prestige, isn't it? Absolutely, which is why it's important to bear in mind, of course, once it's finished, we won't have these bare stone walls. The Great Hall was the political and business hub of castle life. This was where the Lord held court, receiving his tenants and listening to their concerns and grievances. With many of the social rituals of the day being held here, it was important for the interior design to show off his wealth and status to invited guests. Over the next few years, the Great Hall at Guédelon and the Great Tower adjacent to it will be dressed in the style of a 13th century lord and his lady. So this is currently the Lord's chamber. This is where the Lord would sleep with his wife and his children. It's certainly a residential chamber. You can see that from the fireplace on the wall behind us. So it can be heated. That's not true of all the rooms <laughs> in the castle. The stone walls are rough, uneven and drafty. But they would have been dressed and painted. Peter and Tom are going to be painting and tiling some of the castle's indoor spaces while Ruth makes paint. So this is the storeroom. Uh, but first, the storeroom Sarah takes her to the already decorated kitchen under the Great Hall. Quarry, but eventually it will have a render applied and then a lime wash to make it much whiter and brighter. Come and have a look. Oh, I see what you mean. I mean, that's real darkness into light, isn't it? It makes such a difference. People aren't used to necessarily seeing the inside of castle walls rendered and lime washed, but it's made such a difference to the people who actually work in the kitchen because it's it like... It seems sort of bounce off, doesn't it? Turning on an electric light, absolutely. And I guess in terms of hygiene, it would have made a difference oh, as yeah, well. Oh, yeah, definitely, really. It sort of kills anything that might be there and stops bugs getting mm. into all the cracks and things. So you start with a really sterile surface. Repaint it if you don't, whenever you need to. I mean, Obviously, so far, we haven't had the time to render the inside of all the rooms. We've got other priorities at the moment, but as soon as we've finished kind of the major building work, then we can get on with the job of rendering the inside, but I hope also the outside of the castle, because often the outsides of castles were also rendered and lime washed, because in terms of visibility, it just meant that your castle stood out in the landscape. So that's something that we couldn't necessarily get away with in a genuine historic monument, but here on this experimental site, that's something that we can show our visitors. Uh, the Tower of London, the White Tower, was named because it was lime washed on the outside. Outside. The tower nearest the quarry 
known as the Quarry Tower, would have been a guardroom or shooting gallery. Even this would have been brightly decorated. The boys have been tasked by stonemason Fabrice Mangot with rendering the interior wall with lime mortar, the medieval equivalent of plaster. We're going to use two and a half buckets of sand and one lime and water and mix it in. What we're looking for here is the right consistency. Keep on adding a little more moisture. Turn it in, turn it in. A bit more. It's OK. Are you happy? Is that happy. good enough? It's good. Yeah. Cozy workspace. Fabrice demonstrates how a medieval wall is rendered. Put some water. We're not drenching it, though, are we? It's dampening this time. If you don't put water, mortar... Uh, just, it just won't stick. The... Right. OK. Archaeological research has revealed that rendering wouldn't have been applied in several smooth layers, but with a single rough coat, using a technique similar to spreading butter. Interesting technique, isn't it? Keeping the board close to the wall, pushing the, the render up. You understand? Uh, shall I go first? You want yeah, to try yeah, give it a go. <laughs> Let me get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to learn from your mistakes, my friend. <laughs> um, so to do a turret like this, how long do you think it would take? Two, three days. Two, three days. That's ten it. days for you, Two <laughs> Mason. <laughs> At least ten days for me. Good luck. <laughs> we'll need it. <laughs> See you later. As the lime mortar is relatively porous, it will draw out any dampness in the wall and so help to preserve the masonry underneath. It's interesting, isn't it, that we're only putting on one coat, that butter coat. But this is an established practice, isn't it? You always think when you go to the ruined castles in the UK or around Europe, these bare walls are what they were looking at. However, not the case. It was a prestige thing to get a layer of render up, decorate it. Yeah, I mean, castles, the uh, majority of castles, they are just ruins, aren't they? You're coming to them very long after their lives. The medieval manufacture of tiles for castle roofs and floor spaces was an industry in itself. So far at Gedelon, 28,000 tiles have been created for the roof of the Great Hall building alone, a job which took four years to achieve. It's estimated that a total of 80,000 tiles will be needed to cover the roofs of the castle in its entirety. But as the four towers around the curtain wall are still under construction, tile production has now shifted from roof tiles to floor tiles. And Tom is about to discover just how laborious the process is to make just one tile. It's breaking up some of this clay. We're going to use it for our tiles. Obviously not in this state. We actually need to get a lot of these impurities out. But some of the stuff in here is ochre. And ochre can actually be turned into paint. So I'm going to separate some of that out. But now, just stack up on this clay, get it back to the tuilery or the tile makers. In the 11th century, many hamlets and villages in France specialised in tile production to meet increasing demand from the local nobility. And as the medieval tile trade grew, so did the strict regulations it was governed by, designed to standardise production. Oh, that's the thing about clay, isn't it? It's not easy to work. You can feel all the muscles getting involved. You take some. Yeah. In 1280, a decree from Toulouse stipulated that good tiles may only be made from well-pugged clay, well-trampled underfoot, and not over dry. 
feels nice, though. Is this good for the hands, good for the skin? Very nice for the skin, yeah. Some people are paying for this. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky us. <laughs> I've always wanted soft hands. Tom and tile maker Emmerich Guillot are now removing any twigs and stones and making the clay homogenous and malleable. Ah, so this hard lump here, this could be ochre. Yes. The ochre pigments contain colourful iron oxides and are set aside to be used for making paint. An integral feature of castle design were the toilets. They were known as garderobe, the French word for wardrobe. Clothes would often be kept inside them because it was believed the smell of ammonia from urine kept parasites at bay. Garderobe were often built out of the castle walls to allow the waste to drop down through the hole to the ground or moat below. Gedelon keeps a wooden grill over the holes to dissuade any modern day visitors from attempting to spend a penny. It's a big question, isn't it, how people use garderobes? There is little bits of evidence in the earliest of the manners books, which are aimed at pages yeah. who are serving a knight and are hoping to become a squire, become a knight. So it's, it's for little lads, you know. Their first job of the day, before their lord is up, is to prepare the privy. And he's told to make it extremely clean. He's got to sweep it out and make it clean. He's also got to put cloths in there. Not quite sure how the cloths were used, but they're to go in there. And sweet-smelling herbs. Yeah. So that it's somewhere comfortable and pleasant to be. So at least for those at the very top of society, going to the toilet ought to have been... Quite a nice experience. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, it wouldn't have smelled too bad. I mean, I know the poo is going down, and yes, if it's not getting moved, there might be a bit of wafting up. But those herbs would certainly have taken the edge off. And there is, of course, the question of toilet paper. There is. <laughs> I mean, many people think leaves and moss, but let's face it, deforestation. <laughs> Where the heck are you going to get a leaf of the right size in the middle of January? I mean, honestly. And then you also you think, well, moss, but you'd, you'd have to have moss plantations, yeah. wouldn't you, to keep yeah. a big community it, going? It gets very, very dry in summer. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there's nothing to say that people didn't use. I mean, you know as well as I do that archaeologically all sorts of things turn up in cesspits. Yeah. Yeah. So, probably people used whatever was to hand. But I do wonder if maybe the more normal system, especially in a castle, would have been to have your own cloth or rag or flannel to wash yourself with. Or even a communal rag. Quite possibly. Washed out in a bucket. Washed out in a bucket. It, it's perfectly possible. For these privies, that well, certainly is a coat of render, coat of lime wash, probably a loose seat. I think a door might be a good idea too. And a door. <laughs> <laughs> So you have to take some, uh, this thing is uh, grease, is dripping. Uh, you have to take it on your finger like this, and that's for a kick. You put it inside. <laughs> Just work that around. And that's to actually lubricate the side of the template, is it? Yes. So the tile will come out easily at the end. So uh, I like to, to start with hand, because we can feel, you can Feel all the corners. It's very important to have good corners in a tile. If not, the masons are really not satisfied. <laughs> to work is very hard for them. We don't want to upset the masons. No, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so you can use this as well. Right. When you think the corners are okay, you can just finish with. Right, so. But you're not just hitting it, are you? Sort of looks like you're rolling a bit there. Yeah, a little bit. If you like, do it like this. Right, okay. You see. So, okay. It's almost like it's you're nuts. twisting it off as you make contact. That's what's happening with you. With me, it's kind of in between, I think. New tool. New tool. You use this one like this. And try to get something very flat. So, we have to, to see if it's okay on the other side. When there's a problem, it's always with the corners, always something with the corners. Okay, so so we up. have to check the corners. Okay, my corners are good. What do you think? This is perfect. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Very good. Yes, yes. Masons will be happy. 
Okay, you put it there and you do like this. With the grease poke, normally it is green. But you have to sign with the name of this place. And basically that's like quality control. Yes. And if we've done once, we've got another 69 to do. Yes. <laughs> Go back to work. <laughs> Just beyond the castle walls, Ruth is visiting Gedelon's paint house to discover how the ochre found in the quarry and in the clay is used to make pigments for paint. I'm going to start by grinding down the earths. Valérie Urteau is a ceramicist by trade from a family of local potters. She's in charge of pigments, paint making, and decoration at Gedelon. All right. So these are the pieces that. Tom was finding in amongst the clay when he was doing the tiling. Donc on ne sait pas la couleur de la pierre, la couleur qu'il y a dans la pierre, on la connaît pas. Paint's funny stuff. It's it's not the same as dye. Dye stains the fibers of what you're dyeing. So so if you get a, a wood stain, that is a dye for wood. Um, because it, it, it's dyeing the wood fibres in the same way as cloth is a dye that stains the fibres. Paint is different. Paint is bits of coloured stuff that are glued onto a surface. And so, if they're very big lumps, the amount of light coming off is quite small, the colour looks patchy and thin. If you can make the particles very, very tiny, the light will refract off them in a great burst and you'll get a really strong, intense colour. I mean, I shouldn't think a 13th century person thought about light refraction, but they did know that if you grind it thoroughly, you get a much better paint. It's not a bad colour, is it? <laughs> Look good against the yellow, I've got a yellow still on there. Yellow ochre is the other key colour found in the natural Guédelon environment. <laughs> this really is the colour of Guédelon. Oui. Look at that. When you're around here, everything's this colour, absolutely everything. That is the dust that we breathe in whenever you go anywhere near the castle. It's what grinds underfoot. It's the, you know, just look at the place. This is the colour of the ground. So having sort of crushed it up a bit and dissolved it, we're now sieving it. We want small particles. As the mixture settles, the heavier ochre particles fall to the bottom, and the remaining liquid is left out in the sun to dry. The finer particles left behind are then ground down into a powder. It's an enormous amount of work to grind this down to the fineness that you need, but when you just see the range of colours that have been produced, just out of the earth of Gedelon, you can see why people would bother. Just look at it. Out in the castle courtyard, Peter and Philippe Delage, known to his fellow craftspeople as Gandalf, are mixing lime wash, made with one part lime and one part water. What is that in French, lime wash? Is it is Le, de chaux. Le de chaux? Yes. Oh, milk, milk of lime. <laughs> How can you tell it's good consistency? Aye. There's more on the Oh, line. it's really good. Is that? That's good? Yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, it should be enough. Yeah. I'll grab that bucket. Yes. Come on. Yeah. Up the towel. Peter heads towards the Lord and Lady's bedchamber in the Great Tower. To brighten things up in the garderobe. Right, left, English, French, a blush, a gauche. And then it's down, down, down. And it just gives a beautiful, beautiful texture.
I know at Gedlon there was a massive debate as to whether, you know, they should leave the stones, the walls bare, because all this work had gone in by the masons to, to put the stone there. And they say if you cover it up with mortar, if, with render and paint it with lime wash, the public won't see it. But this is how the castles were in the medieval age. Of course, as we come across castles, they're ruins generally. Very little plaster work survives. Ruth and Valerie experiment with a bit of 13th century chemistry. So this is the local yellow ochre earth. Oui, oui. And we're cooking it parce qu'il va devenir rouge. So if you're trying to turn it red. Oui. <laughs> it's quite exciting, isn't it? That this just comes out of the ground, all yellow, and you can get this range of colours. Là, il est déjà, il est déjà en train de changer de couleur. Oh yes. Sur le bord. Yes, you're right. I can see there where it's hot. Look at the difference on my fingers. <laughs> Yellow ochre is a hydrated iron oxide, known as limonite. As it's heated over the fire, some of the limonite turns into hematite, turning the ochre into rich, darker shades, such as burnt sienna and burnt umber. Pigments like this are really ancient. Right across Europe, if you think of those cave paintings right at the dawn of human history, this is the sort of paint that they were using to make them. And if you think of Britain, the Picts, think those people are known or described in the ancient Roman texts as being covered in red paint, the red men, and the Irish talk about it too. It seems to have been a really Celtic thing to do, to paint yourself with red and yellow ochres. Vraiment rouge. Yeah, look at that. Just beyond the castle walls of Gedelon, the earthen kiln used for the firing of tiles is lined with bricks. Kilns were often owned by the local lord, who of course charged his tenants for using them. In the 13th century, regulations governing the work of local tilers in and around Toulouse specified not only the consistency and dimensions of the tiles themselves, but also the size of the kilns used yeah. and the number of tiles permitted to be fired in any one firing. Gedelon fires 4,000 tiles at a time. Bruno Favau is the chief tile maker at Gedelon, and he and his team have presided over 15 experimental firings during the past nine years. Each firing has enabled them to improve and finesse their techniques. The way they're placing them in the kiln, they're leaving gaps so that when they fire this, the flames can work their way up through every single tile and hopefully they'll be in even temperature, making each one hard, each one a very similar colour and, and, and making sure there's no losses. Um, and one of the problems with these tiles, when you dry them out, if there's any water in there and you fire it too quickly, the kiln, that water will expand because it will turn into a gas. It will blow the tile apart. You'll hear a pop. And if these are stacked incorrectly, if one tile goes, several tiles could go. They've been doing this for a number of years. So they know what they're doing. It's, a lot of this is trial and error. Uh, experimental archaeology. They, they, they know what these kilns look like from excavations that have been done in the UK, that have been done in France. Now they know how these kilns actually work, because they've been working these kilns. Out in the peace and quiet of the forest, Ruth is making an essential tool for applying her medieval paint. 
So if I'm actually going to be able to paint anything that looks like something, I'm going to need a decent brush to do it with. So, I went and found some badger hair. Well, I'll be honest, there was, a, there was some roadkill, so I shaved it. Um, I know it sounds a bit of a weird thing to do. <laughs> so, I shaved it as close to the skin as I possibly could in order to keep the hairs all as they grow naturally in order. So when I sort of grab a little tuft of it here, if I sort of try and separate a bit out... And what I want are these long, straight hairs that are what helps a badger shed water. The hair is designed to move water, which is why it makes such great brushes. I'm going to glue those hairs in place so they don't move during the next bit of the process. The glue Ruth is using is gum arabic, hardened sap from the acacia tree, mixed with four parts water. Gum arabic, of course, is water-soluble, so I'll be able to just wash it out of the brush at the end. And can you see how that's coming together now as a point? That's exactly what I want it to do as a finished brush. If you look at a modern paintbrush, there's a sort of metal bit between the hairs and the stick. The 13th century, you're not going to mess around trying to make a metal ferrule. You just do something much, much easier and cheaper. You go and get yourself a feather. Because if you think about it, if I cut that bit off and I cut that bit off, I've got a ready-made tube. I can take a little bit of thread and bind my hairs. It's whipping them into place as tight as I can manage. And I've got a nice firmly held little paintbrush head, which I should be able to poke through. There we go, you can see how firmly that's in there now. See? Paintbrush head. All I need now is jam a stick in the other end. Done. That looks like it'll work, doesn't it? The pressure's on at the tile kiln. The 13th of May in medieval France was regarded as the day of the holy ice. It was believed to be the last day of spring in which a hailstorm would occur, sent by God as a sign of his omnipotence before the arrival of summer. And as hail often turns quickly to heavy rain, that could have disastrous consequences for the fate of this batch of tiles. This firing has already been held up for several days, owing to heavy storms. And once again, dark clouds are looming overhead. <laughs> the rain is coming, and we've just got to get this finished, because if these tiles get wet, it'll be a serious problem. Not only can it affect their ability to fire, essentially that they may explode if if the water gets in there. We also take an awful lot more fuel to dry this kiln out and then get it up to temperature. Medieval tile makers would probably have used mud, earth or wooden boards to weatherproof the tops of their kilns. But for reasons of practicality and efficiency, Gedelon relies on sheets of 21st century corrugated iron. There isn't a moment to lose. Here it comes, the holy ice. The hail. The last time of the year you'll get hail. And almost as if on cue. As feared, the hail quickly turns into a downfall. The kiln will remain covered for several days to allow the soil around it and the wood required for firing. Time to thoroughly dry out. Only once Bruno has assessed that the ground and climate conditions are optimum will the firing finally take place. Good work, Peter, good work. And at this rate, it may have to be postponed for several more days yet. Glad I've got a poncho, Tomo. While the tile firing is on hold, progress is made on the chapel tower. The guard room within the lower floor is undergoing a colourful transformation. Oh, 
Valerie and her colleague Aurélie Payard are using the Gedelon ochre to paint a design on the walls, known as fictive masonry. This was a popular style of artwork among the nobility and royalty throughout Europe in the mid-13th century. It was a less expensive way to create the illusion of the walls having been constructed from expensive white limestone. By lime washing the cheaper sandstone white and then overpainting this with a colorful fake stonework pattern, a look of grandeur and of wealth was created. Transformation of this room is incredible, isn't it? Yeah, to think it goes from bare stone to render to lime wash to this. I mean, this is prestige, isn't it? In 1240, the Queen of England had something very similar in her bedchambers with the addition of flowers. But yeah, it brightens the room, doesn't it? It's like visual, it's yeah. impressive. Yeah. And these fake joints made out of this ochre paint give the impression of highly cut stone. Exactly. <laughs> it's like you are replicating what's beneath it, but in a very stylish way. In a way that actually says to people coming here to visit, this is what I'm worth, I've got money, I can make this happen. The ochre pigments would be mixed with a glue binder made from egg or sometimes rabbit skin to make the paint. I'm not sure if my lines are dark enough. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. I think I top loaded my brush a little bit too much there. <laughs> it, ha it hasn't run. That's the danger, isn't it? Too much pigment on your, your brush. Yeah, do you want to touch up that bit there and then I'll nip in there? No, it's all going wrong. It's going wrong. It's looking awful. It is. Yeah. Well, I've seen worse. Well, I know, but you know, you should put yourself down. <laughs> Every aspect of Gedelon's design is planned by a scientific committee of experts. They work closely with the staff so that every feature is based on authentic primary sources of historical evidence. And just a few miles away, in the village of Moutier, is a key example of that evidence. The Church of St. Peter, built around the year 1000. The Church of the Middle Ages was a huge and wealthy landowner, which exerted a powerful influence over people's lives. And the interiors of its buildings often set a benchmark for the tastes and trends of the era. In the early 1980s, the white distemper covering the interior walls started to crack and peel. This is amazing. Uncovering a fascinating medieval secret. They're everywhere. A painstaking conservation over the next 10 years revealed these stunning ochre murals from the 13th century. They've provided Gedelon with an authentic and illuminating resource from which to draw inspiration for the interior decor of the castle. This is the panel that we're particularly interested in in terms of the work we're doing at Gedelon. Right. Yeah. It's amazing, you can, you can pick out there, you can see the frieze. Yeah. And these five petal flowers, you find these all over the place. Very pop art, <laughs> but it's pure 13th century. Of course, the church would have been absolutely central in people's lives. Mm. Everyone locally would have had to have come to this church. So the paintings on these walls aren't just decoration. They are here to tell stories. They can be read very much like a cartoon strip. Right. It's almost the entertainment of the age. The biblical story is just laid out in scenes. 
And I like the way that the artists have also taken uh, the opportunity to retell the story uh, in their way. If there was any kind of friction mm. <laughs> between them and the church, look, we've got Eve here yeah. sashaying away, being very cheeky, yeah. giving the wink to Adam. Just yeah. behind here. They have a, a wink. We can't see what happens behind the pillar. And then afterwards, they've got a harvest and a child, so... I wonder what the reaction was. Because presumably the villagers would be in on the joke. I only we knew. Ruth is applying some of the techniques discovered at the Church of St Peter to the bedchamber which would have been used to provide hospitality to the Lord and Lady's most distinguished guests. It's the most highly decorated room in the castle so far, and Ruth is using the burnt red ochre paint to restore the rose motifs in the window seat. Obviously, the domestic spaces within a castle are intended to impress. They have to look gorgeous. It's about the look of the place as much as anything else. And naturally, people painted their walls. It's not a church. This isn't about religious storytelling. This was about showing your power. It was about prestige. That up there, that little bit where it's painted to look as if it's masonry, with the little roses in front, often called stones and roses, is perhaps the most typical, as far as we can tell, of all interior decorating designs of the mid-13th century. That is what the Queen of England had on her bedroom walls in the Tower of London. Stones and roses, the very height of fashion. Back at the Church of St Peter in Moutier, Sarah explains how the paintings on these walls have informed the way in which Gedelon's interiors are decorated. And because we don't have a lot of evidence of the types of paintings that were inside castles, right. uh, we, we were always very careful to say to people, okay, we don't know if there was ever a bedroom painted in exactly the style that we've got at the castle, yeah. Yeah. but just a stone's throw from the castle, yeah, at the same time, yeah. we're painting these same patterns and, crucially, it's the same colour palette. This is just like walking out of the yeah. quarry, isn't it? We've got the red ochre, the, the yellow ochres, the browns. I have to say, I mean, you look at the masons when they come out of the quarry and that kind of... the dust and the ochre that's on them, that's that is your colour palette. Absolutely. No, it's, everything's there. So if we wanted to paint in this area it, with blues or greens, yeah. we'd have to buy those pigments in from further afield and they would have been more costly. Yeah. And it's interesting to see that in a church, the decision has obviously been taken not to have too much blue or green. They've used the materials that were available locally. Artwork like this just doesn't really survive in castles. Castles are generally ruins, but churches are such a, an important historical reference. No, that was, a, that was a, certainly a, a challenge for us, and that we were aware that there are very few models of the types of paintings yeah. that there would have been inside castles at this time. It was a very deliberate decision not to use the human figures, right. because obviously these are depicting uh, biblical stories. Yeah. Uh, so we, we stuck very much with the, the flowers, the trees, the geometric shapes. But what we, we're wanting to do is offer people a vision of what a 13th century visitor might have seen and to yeah. get over the fact that the castles weren't bare stone, empty yeah. places. They were decorated and they were full of colour. Oh. Another area of the castle, which is the result of intense research into 13th century architecture, is the chapel. Clément Girard, the chief stone carver at Guédelon, is a highly experienced draftsman, but he's about to undertake his most ambitious project to date. 
Right now, Clement's doing the drawing for what will be the prestige feature of the chapel. So much so, they've actually imported a slightly less hard type of limestone that will be easier to carve. This really is precise work. I am marvelling at the skill he's got. Clement is designing a decorative piece of masonry based on a very common 13th century design found throughout France. It's a niche for the chapel wall with a trefoil-shaped head which will sit upon pillars rising from two small basins called piscine. At Guédelon, white-dressed limestone is used for the more decorative features of the castle. Although it's quicker to dress than the quarry's hard sandstone, it's easier to chip, so great precision is required and mistakes could prove costly. Finally, it's the morning of the long-awaited firing of the kiln. Peter's up early to help share the workload with Florian Dubois. The firebox in the lower chamber has been stacked with logs and twigs. And at last, the first piece of kindling is lit. Within seconds, clouds of wood smoke are billowing out at the top of the firing chamber. It's going to take hundreds of armfuls of wood and many hours of careful monitoring to turn these flames into the roaring blaze required to fire the tiles. A long, hot and exhausting day lies ahead. Stone carvers have completed the first part of the white limestone niche and are ready to transport it to the chapel tower. The hoisting of the stone requires care and attention. The Lord and all of those working for him would have set great store by this sacred work of art. For us, the significance is that this is the first real piece of religious architecture that we've got in the castle. Uh, this is the, the only sacred space within the castle. So we're actually standing here in the area where the altar will be. So this is the holiest place right. of this, this sacred space. Where you'd have the holy water and the oils, yeah. So the, this is the most delicate sculpture that we've done here. As you can see, it's a hand basin. You, you've seen yeah. it being, being dressed earlier. Yeah. But you can see the two dips. Now, we had some priests visiting. We were wondering ourselves why there were these two kind of recesses. And the priests that were visiting suggested that maybe one was for, for washing the priest's hands before the Mass, and that the other one was then for washing the implements that had been used in the Mass. Right. What we've been told, at least, yeah. is that the idea is that all the water that is in uh, this, this piscina, this, this hand basin, is holy water yeah. and as such it can't just be thrown away yeah. uh, all the water will actually and we're not talking about huge amounts but the water will just kind of filter down into the wall and stay within the walls of so the chapel. Be, the, the, the stone of the chapel itself is obviously porous it's going to absorb the yeah. holy water yeah. and essentially make this whole space uh, even more sacred. That's the idea. So our mini little temple here at Guédelon. Uh, so it's been an opportunity, obviously, for the stonemasons to, to use different techniques. Yeah. And then there was a little bit of improvisation that, that gave the, the stonemasons an opportunity to, to kind of have a bit of freedom of movement. You can see yeah. each column is slightly different. different. This is Mathieu's. You can see his mark up here on the stone. And on the other side, we've got Jean-Paul's right here. The 
The mason's marks on dressed stones are a permanent reminder of the ancient skills and techniques of the medieval masons. Each one presents us with a unique signature of the craftsman who carved a particular piece. is rising. The month's rain has taken its toll, and the firing is not going to plan. Everything got wet, the kiln got wet, the wood got wet. So it's just taking that little bit longer to dry everything out, get rid of the moisture. The blaze is still several hundred degrees below what it needs to be. Peter leads a frantic effort to try to save the 4,000 tiles inside. We know today the optimum temperature for successful firing is around 1,000 degrees centigrade. 13th century tilers relied on their experience, their senses, and costly trial and error. They would have been under intense pressure to get firings right. The kiln is just about getting up to temperature now ready to really feed up, and it's pretty soon those tiles will be getting close to firing. But it does mean it's going to be a longer day. I mean, the sun is setting in the sky. We're going to go late into the night. A tiler's trade depended on the local nobility's trust and the reliability of his product. And the strict laws governing the standards of production were rigidly enforced. Tiles must be correctly stacked. The temperature must not be too high or too low. The heat must be distributed evenly throughout the kiln. If not, the results could be underfired, overfired, or otherwise damaged tiles. And the medieval lord would neither accept nor pay for a single substandard tile. Failed firing had serious consequences for a tiler's livelihood. As darkness falls, Peter and the team finally succeed in getting the temperature up to 1,000 degrees centigrade. We've been working since this morning without stopping, and uh, now we are a bit tired. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was hard, but uh, now it's at a good temperature. Right. And what sort of, what sort of colors are you looking for in there? It must stay orange. orange. Right. If it's white, it's too much. If, if you want the, the ties to be fired evenly, right. we must stay at this temperature during two hours. All right, uh, OK. But are you happy, Sibyl? Yes. Yeah? yes, we are. Yes, it's a dream. Can you imagine living in a world with no electric lights? I mean, tonight, we have the stars, we have the moon, and we have the tile kiln. 4,000 tiles. They're just about to block this up with wood, and they're going to seal it in. It's a lot of hard work at the coalface, because this is industry. Could you imagine what it must have been like to see a castle being built of stone, surrounded by these kilns that were firing flames into that night sky. But sat back here, thinking about perhaps the hell down there, and the heavens up there, and your tiles currently in purgatory. Which way are they gonna go? Have you been good? Will they be used in that castle? Who knows?
It takes several days for the kiln to cool down. Peter's helping to unload the tiles and examine the results. Même seulement les, regarde, en les frottant, il y a pas de souci. Ouais, tac, ça c'est beau. You can hear this? Yeah, I can hear it. It's really like this sound is perfect for us. That ringing sound is what you're looking for. Perfect sounds. Ah, oh. it's, a, it's a good sound. So, um... what, why are you guys spitting on the tiles? Oh, um, to see <laughs> to see if it's cooked. Because sometimes the sound is not enough. Right. We, we, the sound can be at the middle. We don't know if it's raw, cooked. So we can spit on it. And if the saliva stays there, it's cooked. If it's going inside the tile, it's it's not. Every single tile coming out of this kiln, you're quality controlling yes. them. You're listening to sound. Yes. If you're unsure, you spit on it. If it goes in, yeah. yeah we can't spit on everyone. Four thousand. We don't have. Oh. <laughs> 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 but uh, what what happens if they if they overcook? Um, oh, we have an example. So it was not for this firing. It was for one before yeah. when overcooked. It's going like that. So we have this bubble of gas inside, and the bubble is big, is going bigger, and uh, the tire will burst with time. So this is good quality, handmade. <laughs> well, I, I I saw how hard you guys worked and how long it takes to make these tiles. I mean, it's it's, it's good. I'm pleased. I'm you know I'm happy for you. you know? <laughs> We're happy too. Uh, we, especially with this firing, we're really happy. Yes, we have very good results. It's really nice to have it. The fired tiles are now used to floor the fully rendered and lime-washed quarry tower. It will take thousands more tiles and several more years of rendering, lime washing and painting before the entire castle finally looks like it might have done in the 13th century. This is really starting to look like a finished castle, isn't it? You know, with the tiles and the walls all plastered and painted. It's starting to get that feel of a living space. I'll be honest, I did not appreciate how much work and effort it would take to get this stage actually happening. You know, the clay for the tiles, finding the paints. But when you see it, it's unbelievable. And I really can't wait. I know it's a long time in the future yet, but for the furniture and the furnishings, yeah. for the textiles to finally arrive. Well, it emphasizes that it's actually a living space and not just a defensive building, doesn't it? In moments like this, you look at this, you know, yes, I could actually sit here and relax. Yeah. It's not all about yeah. warfare when it comes to castles. Yeah. This is an entertaining space. Next to the Great Hall, you, know, you can bring your more select guests in here to wind them and dine them, and perhaps a guest bed in here, and, and everybody else sleeping around on mats. You can get the feel for that sort of convivial way of life. I have to say, though, the medieval period, far more colorful than I thought it was. Castle dominated the medieval landscape. And Britain has some of the finest in the world. Today, most are decaying relics, many of their secrets buried in time. Now, historian Ruth Goodman and archeologists Tom Pinfold and Peter Ginn are turning the clock back to relearn the secrets of the medieval castle builders. This is the ultimate in medieval technology. The origin of our castles is distinctly French, introduced to Britain at the time of the Norman Conquest of 1066. One, two, one, tire! 
Here in the Burgundy region of France is Guédelon Castle, the world's biggest archaeological experiment. A 25-year project to build a castle from scratch using the same tools, techniques and materials available in the 13th century. It's a lot of hard work at the coalface because this is industry. For the next six months, Ruth, Peter and Tom will experience the daily rigours of medieval construction. Drop down. Yeah. Yep, there. And everyday life. How workers dressed oh. and ate. You can really smell your food, Ruth. <laughs> and the art of combat. Oh. This is the story of how to build a medieval castle. Four months into their adventure, the team have been immersed in the building work alongside Gedanon's masons. Perfect. Oh, again. <laughs> They've learned how a castle was defended in times of war. Every stone has to be in line because this is going to go up and up and up. And discovered how lavishly decorated castles were on the inside. This was about showing your power. It was about prestige. Now the team delve deeper to discover the secrets of the skilled communities whose combined expertise made such mighty castles. It's just this mass of molten metal. Castles were not made from stone alone. Without the mastery of the medieval blacksmiths transforming metal, and the carpenter's sophisticated grasp of geometry. Wow, is all I can say. The castle could never be built at all. This is one of those moments when everything comes together extremely fast in quite a dramatic way. The first castles introduced to Britain by the Normans were mostly built not of stone, but of wood, making them quicker and cheaper to construct. Their favorite design was the Motten Bailey. Following the conquest of 1066, they erected hundreds at strategic locations across England and Wales. One of the first structures completed here at Gedelon is an example of a classic wooden Motten Bailey. You know, I, I can never remember. Which one's the Mott and which one's the Bailey? The Mott is your mound, on top of which you're probably going to end up with a, a wooden tower like this, which in our case in Gidlong goes on to be the Great Tower. And your Bailey is the area enclosed by your palisade fence, as we can see here. So this could be your Bailey. So the Bailey becomes the courtyard, the palisade fence comes the curtain of walls. Exactly, that's the evolution of the castle right there, really, isn't it? While most early castles were made of timber, at key sites, the Normans invested in stone, expanding on the Motten Bailey principle of high tower and defensive surrounding wall, but using materials that were far more imposing and durable. William the Conqueror built stone castles to make a statement. Norman rule was here to stay. The fact so many of these castles are still standing after almost a thousand years is testament to the precision and skill of their builders. It's this remarkable standard of craftsmanship they're seeking to recapture at Gedelon. Most of the walls are built with rubble stones, which are easy to produce in the quarry. Every 10 feet, the masons built leveling courses, rows of carefully dressed flat stones that strengthen the wall and also allow the masons to regulate the structure. 
it's too irregular, if you're using just blocks that are shaped but not specific, you'll actually end up with a weak wall. By putting in the levelling courses, you flatten everything out, you start building again from a horizontal surface. And so you'll do that again and again right up to the top. And that just keeps the strength of the wall and allows you just to basically balance out and work from a flat surface. Tom is helping to extract a particularly large stone from the quarry by the castle to use in a levelling course. Mathieu Rigo has been a quarryman here for nine years. At the moment, we're just making a small hole, and into that we're going to insert the wedge. And what we want to do is hit that perfectly, and that should actually work its way along a natural crack in the rock. So it's not as simple as just smack, 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 there's your hole, put in the wedge. Come, sir. You tread that big, come, sir. Okay. <laughs> Each different type of rock has its own extraction method, and quarrymen's skills were handed down from father to son. Okay, we've got our split now, and we just need to separate these two bits of stone. So it's over to the crowbar. Get that in. I'm going to lift it up. We're going to apply some more wedges. In the Middle Ages, some quarrymen also worked as stonemasons. Masons were well-paid free men who enjoyed exceptional status among the workers of the age. They travelled widely, their skills constantly in demand for building great castles and churches. On a construction site, the stonemason's lodge is where they gathered to eat, drink, and discuss ideas and designs. Lodges became regarded as strongly symbolic buildings, where the closely guarded secrets of the mason's craft were shared and geometry was taught. In an age where there was little scientific knowledge and a great deal of superstition, it's easy to see why a mason's lodge acquired an almost mystical status. Professor Ronald Hutton is a historian, specialising in medieval and early modern folklore. We're sitting in a mason's lodge and those words sort of conjure up certain images. Is that true? I mean, was there any such thing as Freemasonry? in the 13th century? Certainly not. Freemasonry as we know it comes along in the end of the 16th century. Actually in Scotland, where they decide to pull together the mason's skill of understanding geometry and structure in order to try and understand the secrets of the universe. And that began the secret society of people dedicated to knowledge, which grew into Freemasonry as we know it. So it has absolutely nothing to do with this sort of medieval tradition of building. Well, medieval masonry is the seed and modern Freemasonry is the full-grown plant. If you're a medieval mason, you are doing God's work. You're building God's houses, the churches and cathedrals. And as God is the grand architect of the universe using natural geometry, so human masons reproduce that. They are sub-creators, but are also in a highly mobile, skilled, dangerous trade. That's why a lodge like this is so important. If you are a free mason in the medieval sense, in other words, you're free to go where you like, to have a place like this, a temporary home from home, where masons can gather, share information, share hot tips, and simply live, play dice, booze, chill out after the day's work is done is absolutely essential. Stonemasons were not the only skilled craftsmen on the castle building site. Castles required huge amounts of wood, and this called for carpenters. Roof structures, doors, walkways and drawbridges were all made from timber. Wood was also key to the building process, from scaffolding 
and lifting machinery to basic buckets. Here at Gerdelon, the wooden scaffolding is a really visible part of the build. It's also one of the most precarious and potentially dangerous. Indeed, we know that in 1138 at Canterbury Cathedral, William Sons, the master builder, was up inspecting the high vaults when he fell from the scaffolding and was paralysed. Essential to secure scaffolding are pot logs, the timbers which stick out from the wall for the scaffold planks to rest on. The timbers are deeply embedded in the walls in potlog holes, into which the logs are inserted. By planning potlog holes at regular intervals, the timbers can be continually raised in line with the stonework, avoiding the need to build a scaffold up from the ground. Carpenter and stone mason have a problem. Florian Ranucci is the master mason, overseeing all construction on the site. He's ultimately responsible for workers' safety here at Gedelon. Obviously, we don't want anybody to die <laughs> while we're building this castle. So there are certain compromises. You're having to have some modern health and safety issues with the scaffolding. How close is the scaffolding you're using to being 13th century scaffolding? And how much is because you need modern health and safety? Well, the 21st century technique uh, for us to work is only to put uh, iron right. and also modern wood. So when we look around us, the 13th century scaffolding wouldn't have looked very different. Mm. The wood would have been hand produced, not machine produced. And instead of the bolts, what would it have been instead of the bolts? Ropes. Rope. Oops. It would have just been tied. Yes. Yeah. So we have to do uh, a, bit of a compromise for our safety and yeah. for uh, building in a good way. Yeah. But we don't change the way of building. We yeah. use wood. The completed castle will have a chapel built into the East Tower where the Lord and his family could practice their religious devotions. Even laymen would have heard mass at least once a day, so a chapel was considered essential. Nicolas Touchefeu is head carpenter here. They must get the scaffolding in place to enable the masons to build the next level of the chapel tower. The masons have made a potlock hole, and the carpenters have prepared the wood in advance, complete with a mortise and tenon joint, something still favoured by carpenters today. There we go. So not only do you have a, a mortise and tenon here, that can be pegged. You've also got a, a bird mouth joint, so the putt log is actually sitting on this as well as in it to give it maximum security. And then that putt log goes into the castle wall. Pegs? And this side. This side. It's secured with oak pegs. No. More? No. no? It's okay. Okay. And that is the scaffolding. In, and the build can commence. As well as the stonemasons being largely dependent on the carpenters, both were also reliant on another set of craftsmen. Blacksmiths. From hinges on doors, to bars on windows, or the chains that raised a drawbridge, metal was crucial. At the foot of the castle is a blacksmith's forge. Martin Claudel produces the tools and metalwork required at Guédelon. Peter and Tom are helping mix crushed clay with sand and water. They're going to help build a furnace, or bloomery, 
to smelt iron for tool making. Think about a blacksmith shop, you think about all the little bits of metal kicking around, bits of broken nail, bits of uh, uh, fragments of iron that come off while you're, you're smacking it with a uh, hammer. And this furnace is a way of melting those all down and turning them back into metal that can be used. These big old bellows. <laughs> That's good. Once the furnace is complete, they just need to put in the door, held in with an ash paste so they can easily open it. The giant double bellows are attached to the furnace to pump air into it when lit, raising the temperature from 800 to over 1,300 degrees, sufficient to melt the scrap iron and steel. It's a lovely uh, melodic sound with the bellows. It's the respiration. Breathing in and out. We've made the bloomery, we've made the furnace. We're going to put in charcoal, we're going to throw in the scrap iron, bring it up to temperature, melt this down, and hopefully, at the bottom, we're going to get, at the very least, reusable iron, but perhaps we'll get steel. But that's all about your carbon content, the purity of the fuel, and the ability to do a good smelt. Steel is iron with a specific amount of carbon dissolved inside its structure. When the temperature in the furnace rises, more and more carbon from the charcoal is absorbed by the iron. But it's a difficult balancing process. This was medieval technology, long before a modern understanding of chemistry. But hard steel was so useful for tools that even small amounts were precious. And pretty soon, we'll be ready to crack open that door and hopefully have a bloom of steel from which we can make tools. We've reached that moment. The iron that's gone in the top has melted. It's reached the bottom. It's hopefully turned into a steel bloom. Clermont is just hacking out that sort of uh, ash and water paste that Tomo used to patch up that door. Oh, door's off. We can see the bloom. It's right at the top oh, yeah. of that charcoal bed. It's just this mass of molten metal. All those scrap bits of metal melted down. Ah. It's amazing to see this happen in a blacksmith shop. I've never seen that before. It just means that these guys are self-sufficient. They need to compact the bloom to start the folding process for working it to shape into tools. Next, the metal is rapidly cooled or quenched in water to lock in its hardness. Martin then tests it with the steel file. Parts that feel softer than the file are iron. Harder bits are hopefully steel. I believe we got steel. We just have to, to work it to see. Being able to produce hard steel enabled blacksmiths to make sharp cutting edges of tools like axes, which is what Martin is going to forge later. In the Middle Ages, the lords of castles like this one were part of the driving force behind the clearance of woodland to make way for crops and to provide timber and firewood.
There are more forests in France today than there were in the 13th century. The location of Guédelon Castle was determined in part by the surrounding forest, which provides large amounts of wood. This is our tree. Oh, it has got a good bend on it, hasn't it? Toi, tu fais comme ça. Jean-Michel Louret is the head woodsman. Relax, relax, regarde. He gives the team a lesson in using medieval-style wood axes to fell a tree. This is going to take us for ages. <laughs> Trees were selected with specific uses in mind, depending on their size and shape. You're trying to make it look like a big pencil at the bottom. Sarah Preston, the site administrator, is helping overcome the language barrier. Ça mériterait d'être plus plus lisse. Don't look over this side, then. <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrible mess. So Jean-Michel saying we're getting to the final stages now. What he can't tell us is where the tree will fall exactly. So it so, could actually fall back this one. Potentially. <laughs> so what you're going to do is keep working. So you keep working, keep working, and at one point you will start to hear the tree cracking. Don't stop. It's so easy now to go and get your lump of wood or get your bit of stone. Or the, the raw materials of life are easy to acquire. Yeah. When you see how much work is involved in the simplest of things. And not just that, it's the tools to get those raw yeah. materials. And you're looking at the complete tool set of the woodsman. Yeah. And it is, it's something that's been forged in that blacksmith's yeah. area. Okay. And yeah. it is going to last a lifetime. And they would have cost a fortune, really, for an ordinary yeah. working yeah. man. I yeah. mean, the tools of your trade, people pass them down in families yeah. because yeah. you, you have to. They're precious. too expensive yeah. to, to acquire. This is definitely a spectator sport, I've decided. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Very easy to critique someone's acting yeah, skills. Yeah, it distance. is, isn't it? I can see a whole new game show coming up now. Can you hear the crack yet, Tomo? I can hear cracking. I don't know if it's actually the tree or me. <laughs> it is always one of the things I like about these experiments: it's seeing how much skill there is in the simplest of things, and how much intelligence and cleverness there is. Mm. Are you calling Tomo yeah. simple? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Uh, maybe seems <laughs> simple. Uh, maybe, maybe that's more accurate. <laughs> Part of the woodsman's skill is to plan so the tree falls safely in the right place without breaking on impact. <laughs> Once the trunk has been squared up, it will be used by the carpenters up on the chapel tower. Much of a castle owner's wealth came from exploiting his land and its tenants. One way of doing this was to build water mills, providing a regular source of income. These mills would have made a huge difference to the lives of local villagers and laborers. Producing flour for their bread required up to two hours a day of hand grinding. But one mill could produce as much grain as around 40 people grinding by hand. According to the Doomsday Book, in England, as early as 1080, there were over five and a half thousand water mills. Little is known about the mills of this time. However, one of the most ambitious projects at Gedelon this year is the construction of a 12th century style water mill. The castle team and archeologists have based its design on the remains of two ancient mills discovered in Jura, in the east of France, in 2008.
Sophie Winsor is one of a team of carpenters who painstakingly worked on the water mill over a two-year period. Today is the moment of truth. Today we are going to try to make some flour in the water mill. So we are going to open this loose. The water is going to run and hopefully the wheel is going to turn yeah. and grind some grain. So this, this uh, being able to do this, you can actually see it working and relate it back to the, the evidence you found in yes. the archaeological record. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is why it's absolutely experimental archaeology. Is that why, that's why we tried several times and each time we have maybe to change some pieces and to do some modification. So I think you can start by opening the sluice. Get then, the water down yes, there. Yes, yeah. and then we will need someone to watch if the wheel is all right with the paddles and everything stays. So there is an right. emergency stop here with somebody you know, ready to close it because if there is something in the mechanism, it yeah, destroys yeah. everything yeah. in a minute. <laughs> and that's a lot of work really uh, yeah. very quickly. So <laughs> we can say that. Emergency sluice, <laughs> yes. sluice. People making sure those paddles are yeah, fine. Yeah, and shaking oh. if there is no big trouble in the gear. Yeah, boom. Right. Stuffing across, bridging it. Oh, wow. Right. Better get That's down fast. to our second station. But there's a problem. The mill wheel isn't turning nearly as quickly as it ought to be. Give it a push. It means that we don't have enough pressure. Right. So the grain isn't coming out. And... No, it's not going down. It's, it's all from wood, so it's a yeah. uh, lot of friction yeah. everywhere. So resistance, and we have to find solutions. <laughs> you can hear the noise, can't you? The yeah. noise of the woods. It's, yeah. <laughs> and also, it's true that the stones have to get uh, a bit used. Yeah, and then okay. it will be a bit smoother. Everything is too new as well. It needs yeah. to be used a bit. Yeah. And this is experimental archaeology, so everything that's going on here is all about trying to work out exactly how these worked. I mean, it's easy to think of a water mill in terms of water management, and the water is coming down the sluice, and it is going into this wheel. But the problem is, it's not sufficient to drive this mill. There's too much friction currently in the, in the mechanism. So although the stones are going round, they're only going round because we're helping them out. So we just need to fine tune this a little bit more to get this working perfectly. But we're very close, very close. Two years of painstaking research and building could be in vain if the problems can't be remedied. But Peter and Tom are hopeful that some simple modifications and liberal application of lubricating pig fat will solve the teething problems and get the mill working properly. Perhaps the most essential part of the blacksmith's role was keeping the workforce equipped. The stonemason's tools become blunt after a few days' work. Without a blacksmith to sharpen them, all the stone cutting on site would come to a halt in less than a week. Because iron and steel were so costly, tools needed to last as long as possible. But today the blacksmiths are making a new side axe. You work together as a team, you hit, Vincent hits, but you don't talk, it's all quiet. Is that just experience or you're listening to the sound? Yes, it's exper experience. We used to work together and uh, we have a code. When I uh, let my hammer strike uh, on the anvil, it, it means stop. That's it. So in the, all the noise of working in the forge, it doesn't actually matter. It's a visual sign as well. That's it. 
A piece of hard steel will be welded onto an iron axe head to make a hard cutting edge. The blade is starting to taper down. I'm going to cut it any minute now. Right? OK. Tom has a go at cutting steel. It's not as easy as I thought it would be. Oh, I'm making some progress. What the guys are doing is just measuring up the steel against the iron axe head. It needs to be pretty precise. Until modern times, few methods of accurately measuring temperature existed. So blacksmiths traditionally judged it by watching the changing colours of the metal. Once the iron is white hot, the hard cutting steel can be welded onto it. It's taken a lot of work to make this axe, but when you think about it, it's a crucial tool for building the castle, making the water mills, just shaping anything that was required, like scaffolding. You can't do without an axe. And these guys are working hard constantly to just make sure those tools are available for the entire site. The climax of the process, changing the qualities of metals, was one of the medieval blacksmith's most carefully guarded secrets. Martin heats the axe to a critical temperature, which changes the steel structure. He then quenches it in vegetable oil, which locks in this new hardness without distorting the blade as water might. The side axe is finally sharpened on stone. Medieval stonemasons may have been revered, but many held the blacksmith's craft as supernatural. Blacksmiths were intensely magical because since uh, prehistory, they'd performed this extraordinary sorcery of conjuring metal from rock and then fashioning it into beautiful things. Medieval blacksmiths were regarded as great healers. Uh, a pregnant woman afraid of labor, a sick child, uh, an adult with a lingering illness would be laid upon a blacksmith's anvil and the blacksmith would pretend to hammer them, to hammer the illness out of them. And people really believed that but like royalty, they had the power to heal by touch. Was that something that was considered to be dangerous magic, or was it just part of life and nobody batted an eyelid? It's pretty scary. Uh, blacksmiths are often believed to make pacts with the devil, mm -hmm. uh, ironically, in which the blacksmith usually comes off better. For example, blacksmiths are believed to be the only people who can do jobs for the devil, like shoeing his black horses, without paying the price of their soul. And there are even tales of blacksmiths, some of them saints, who are capable of grabbing the devil's nose and their red-hot pincers and tweaking it to get rid of him if he's annoying. How on earth did the church respond to that? The church canonised some of these blacksmiths. St Dunstan in uh, England is a classic case. Otherwise, they simply got along with it. Blacksmiths were too useful. And as long as they went to mass and didn't have an alternative kind of religion, there's no problem. Here at Gedelon, carpenters, stonemasons and archaeologists have spent weeks modifying the mill mechanisms and the water channel. Peter and Tom are going to attempt to grind their bag of grain. We are going to start with the wheel. Philippe Delage has been closely involved in the mill project from the beginning. Which we are going to, to turn. And he's going to help them try it out. Oh, it's hard. You can hear that stone singing. It's unbelievable how many pieces, man-made, each one of them, actually involved in this wheel alone, let alone the rest of the actual building. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of wood. It's a lot of wood. <laughs> All right, good. We got enough water. Uh, Thomas, maybe you can open the van? Uh, the sluice gate here? Yeah, that's okay. it. You know, you use this uh, timber. A bit of just leverage. Oh. Right, and it goes. after 
you put Keep it wet this open. one underneath, like this. And that will just control the amount of water we let through. Yes. So we are going to climb up there. Shout out loud when it's time for me to. You're controlling our power, man. <laughs> Flower power. Fill the hopper with grain. It's ready to be made into flour. Yeah. I suppose all we need is Tom to open that gate. Yeah. You are ready, Thomas? Ready. And open. Here it comes. Tom's opening the sluice gates. The water's coming down. About to hit the wheel. It's about to hit the wheel. Hit the wheel. The mill has a paddle wheel, eight feet in diameter. This turns an axle, turning the smaller pit wheel. The teeth of this turn the lantern wheel, which turns the spindle. This powers the millstone, over three feet in diameter. The bottom stone, the bedstone, is fixed, and the top one, the runner stone, revolves to grind the grain. The water is turning that wheel and our stones are going. Finally, the mill is operating as intended, recreating an extraordinary feat of medieval engineering. Right now, I can really appreciate how precise everything has to be. This isn't pinpoint accurate. It's going to damage it. So, Peter, how's it going? Have we got flour? We're getting... Fr yeah, it, 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 it's brilliant. It's superb. I mean, yeah. Wow. Wow is all I can say. You knew... Yeah. You built this. No, I talk it. I can't believe uh, such a low head. I mean, that, that water is falling maybe a metre, going under a wheel. You're managing to turn a stone that is 200 kilograms and you're managing to grind your grain into flour. This is the beginning of industry, I suppose. And to have this associated with a castle, you can free up people from the daily grind to do other things. It's amazing. Oh, here I'm he here. comes. <laughs> have some power. <laughs> oh, let's see what we've got. Is that it? What is that <laughs> it? Oh, fantastic. Philippe, are you happy? I think it's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing how much work it actually takes to create one mill. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of bits of wood, these massive bits of stone. You've got to channel all that power from water. Now, this is a big effort, but if you're going to create bread, you've got to feed families, soldiers, workforces. Build it's all worth it. Yeah. Exactly. It all comes back. What does the castle need? It needs to be fed. Yeah. And this is what makes it happen. And once it was up and running, as well as producing food for the inhabitants of his castle, the Lord could start making money from his mill. Tenants on his land would have been obliged to use it and pay for the privilege. The next major project of the castle is to build a wooden walkway, or gallery, on the inside of the chapel tower. This would allow soldiers to get from the main building to the castle walls, without disturbing the sanctity of the Lord's Chapel. In the Middle Ages, carpenters used geometry to plan their wooden structures. They drew on the floor because parchment was expensive and paper still very rare. The carpenters are planning a section of the gallery. 
by marking out a full-scale plan. Every piece of wood in Gedlong Castle starts its life here on the tracing floor. First of all, the plans, they are drawn on the floor to a one-to-one -one scale. Medieval units of measurement were not standardised, varying from place to place. Isn't it interesting watching them work to have few numbers come into it? It's mathematics, but it's mathematics of proportion, it's geometry, it's, you know, two of this, three of that, halve it, double it, quarter it, third it. It's not 0.652. In French, the word for thumb, pouce, is the same as the word for inch. Every site would have its own units of measurement. That's a thumb, isn't it? So it's an inch. The pouce. The pouce. Palm. And palm. So that's your hand span. I like the fact the inch corresponds to the word for thumb. I really <laughs> like that. I rather like the fact that feet and inches in yards is something that used to be right across Europe. You know, we tend to think of it as a very British mm. thing these days. It's just that we hung on to it when everybody else left it behind. Yeah. But it used to be that there were all these little inches, all these little feet all over the place, everywhere different. But the, the system of measurement here at Gedlon is based on a, a medieval castle that's very close by. And if we was to turn up there at the start of the build in the 13th century, on a board, it would say, this is what an inch is on this side, this is what yeah. the Based on span one person's is, body. We don't know quite which is. person's body, but... Yeah based on somebody's body. And if they were to pass away, those would have been written down to be used until the end of the build. Mm. To make a straight line on the tracing floor. It needs to be quite tight. <laughs> they use string with red ochre powder. Pull it quite high. Yep, OK. Corresponding lines are made on each section of wood before matching them to the floor plan. And then they are leveled out and then they're plumbed up. So you're constantly jiggling and it's very, very subtle. Little wedges going in to make sure everything's perfect. Once everything is lined up, they can cut the joints. They also chisel carpenter's marks into the wood. These are a code to identify the pieces of the frame, making it easier to reassemble on the castle walls. Each team would have had their own code. Finally, they assemble the completed frame. This is the gallery. I mean, I can't believe from a few simple lines drawn on the tracing floor that we have this amazing structure ready to go into the castle. And here at Gedlon, they almost think that carpentry, it's, it's almost a form of genius. There's so much thinking involved. I mean, this line running through all these beams, it, it's precise. This can be unassembled by the carpenters. It can be put to one side, it can be hoisted up, reassembled outside the chapel tower doesn't need to be the same carpenter because you've got all the marks here. It is a flat pack medieval gallery. This is going to flip up this way. My feet would be down here. This is a handrail. There will be spindles here. My head would be here and I'd be looking out onto the courtyard. And this is how you build a castle. <laughs> It's thought about 30 people would live in a castle like this, from the lord and his family down to servants and guards. They would have been fed from the castle kitchen, and bread would have been the staple of all their diets, made in the stone bread oven. It's sponging quite nice, look at that. Ruth and Tom are going to try making a basic bread with flour from the new mill. Ruth is using a rising agent, which was popular in the Middle Ages. I mean, it smells a little alcoholic. Yeah. 
Our sourdough is probably the most ancient method of raising bread because there's next to nothing involved, you know, you're just saving a bit from the previous day's batch. When I made the last batch of bread, I just broke a little bit of dough off and put it to one side and I popped it in some water with a fresh little bit of flour and this is the result. So sourdough is literally sourdough? Yeah, it is. There's no trick. There's no trick. There's no trick at all. So I've not added any yeast and I won't add. And this is going to be an awesome carbohydrate for us, a real staple diet. It is. I mean, this is your real basic working man's bread. I mean, I'll be honest, at the moment it doesn't look that appealing, but I guess you've, uh, you've got work for me to do. Well, do you want to give it a knead? Go on. I'm, I'm a do big I add any of this? Yeah, add a little bit at a time and just start working it in. So it is fingers in, like you were mixing lime putty, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Turning it in. Turning it in. Like Turn it in. That's it. I mean, it's starting to look a bit more how I imagine uh, <laughs> bread would look bread at this state. Bread right, yeah. I thought I was coming in for a break. Coming yeah, to the kitchen, you no. said. Well, it's not my fault you admitted you'd never made bread. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, were these like family affairs or you know, a proper big business? How would a, a baker make you, his money? Well, the like? majority of bread was made at home on a, on a family scale. Right, OK, so women. you wouldn't go out and buy, you'd actually have it in-house. In the 13th century, most of it is being homemade. OK, that's behaving much more like a lump now, isn't it? When you think, you know, work has evolved in this at every stage. It's massive it is, effort, isn't it? isn't it? It is a bit bigger. So are you happy with that? So just roll it into a nice loaf shape. All right, lovely. Yeah. And then I want you to make a deep very fast cross and means that it's broken the surface tension it's easy for the loaf to rise right. and you also get more high quality crust for your crumb okay so two cuts nice donk, and quick donk. that's the one burning wood heats the oven and is then raked out before the bread is placed inside that's pretty warm out? Do you rake, rake out? out i can do that So what am I doing this, Ruth? It seems incredibly dangerous. It is incredibly dangerous. You're right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a but bit basically, of fun, isn't it? we don't need the fire anymore. The fire has done its job. It's heated the stones. It's brought them up to cooking temperature. And now we need to get the oven clean, ready for the bread to go in. Right. And we also want to put a little bit of steam in there so that it will help that final rise. Right. Just scrape it all to the side so, so you've got access to the fire. That is. Your 13th century oven health and safety, that little move there. <laughs> that's your safety. Right, next job. We've next got a mop job. that's been s s soaking. You need to just quickly mop out the oven. You're not just cleaning, you're also adding steam. That's so a mop, is that's it? That's a mop. You're going to get it okay. in and throw it around. OK. That's it. And you can see how that water doesn't just turn to steam. It just sort of seems to almost explode into steam. Look, that's oven's a... dry. Your next challenge <laughs> is to get it on your pal. Right. There we go. There we go. Make sure it's sliding on the pal. It is. Oh, there. there you go. Sticking it in. Right bang in the middle. Right bang in the middle. That's it. Done. Oh, look at that go. Yeah. I'll give you a shout when it's done. OK. <laughs> I'll go back. Back to work, then. <laughs> While the bread bakes, Tom tries out the side axe Martin made to square up wood, creating flat faces from a rounded trunk. This is the weirdest axe I've ever used. It's that the balance is all off. So we've got a cutting edge and a flat side, and that actually helps to cut, but also force some of these fibres apart. If you put the axe down like this, you can actually see the pole is slightly tilted, and that allows you to work along the wood nice and close. But because you're holding it here, there's no risk to your knuckles or your fingers as you work. But what it comes down to, and what I'm having trouble with, is that fine tuning. I know what I want to do, I can see what's marked out for me. But uh, I'll be honest, it's always happening that way. Ha, 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 ha. 
Moments of truth, Ruth. There's your loaf done. It looks quite a dark loaf. Was that the intention? Dark. <laughs> you mean burned? <laughs> <laughs> you mean burned? I'm not a baker, so I don't want to make that uh, <laughs> that claim. Uh -oh. Looks like we've got the oven a bit hot. <laughs> All right, let's have a whisker out. That is definitely. Burnt. <laughs> well, it's not like a sausage at the barbecue, isn't it? You could probably still eat it. Oh, that's on fire on the bottom. Oh, it's cooked, definitely. That sounds healthy. That oven was too hot. It shouldn't scorch like that in that time. Oh, well, we'll scrape it off and... Hey. Sally, my first loaf of bread. I'm going to eat it. The wooden gallery is ready to be installed beside the chapel tower. Oui. You're going to poke it. Time for beer. Yeah. <laughs> Each carpenter is going to take a post. Myself and Tomo are just here at the handrails to make sure it doesn't topple over that way. They're going to remove the chocks, and the three posts are going to sink down. The mortars and tenon joints will come together and this gallery will be locked in place, ready to take the final roof section that covers it in. Here we go. Trucks out. Oh. <laughs> and the gallery's in place. With the basic frame in place, long beams are now needed for the roof section. Oh, my. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> sorry, mate. Pull. Push. Sorry. Up. Straight up, yeah? Yeah. Okay. After all that slow work where people seem to work for hours and hours and hours and produce very little, this is one of those moments when everything comes together extremely fast in quite a dramatic way. And that... Ready. Up. Yeah. Going to... yeah. Drop down. Yeah. Yep. There. Okay. Yeah. Et il faut l'envoyer vers moi. Ouais. <laughs> With a bit of force, the joints go into place and are pegged into position. Just need to pop a roof on it, and there you are. We've got a link between the, the great hall and the curtain wall. It's physical work, but to think when we first saw that drawing of what this was going to look like, yeah. I didn't think we'd actually see this at the end of it. Yeah. It's brilliant. The water mill would also have a mill pond, owned by the Lord, which was a source of fish. And castle workers might well have been rewarded for their hard work with a fish supper. That is a scary beast. It is, isn't it? Pike was a favoured dish at feasts throughout the Middle Ages. So freshwater fish was actually quite highly prized. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and pike more so than things like salmon and trout. Yeah, that is a medieval fish and half. Ham full of leaves, and fat me. hen, lovely medieval vegetable. And you're not doing anything to this pike? No, just shove him on as he is. So, half an hour, should be done. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, don't drop the fish. You smell good. Okay, straight to table, I say. Straight to table. 
the pike is ready for presentation to Sophie, Philippe, and others who worked so hard building the mill and gallery. Here we go. Wow, oh, look wow. at that. That's, That's very impressive. impressive. Nice catch. Wow. Love to say I caught that myself. <laughs> <laughs> I want it's someone nice. to notice I have brought something to this meal. <laughs> in honour of the carpenters, you see. <laughs> That's no way to treat your first loaf. <laughs> wow. That's brutal. Oh, oh that's wow. just look at that. <laughs> see how soft that is. It's got a good crumb. Good crumb. Do you want to break mm. some up for the people Shall over there? Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Ruth. Philippe, yeah, uh, <laughs> having worked the mill, um, yeah. what do you think of the bread coming out? I mean, uh, it's not bad. Not bad. No, Look how mm. solid this pike flesh is. Yeah, this is why it's one of the king of fish. You can actually carve it pike, into finger-sized pieces. That's the, which is the point. You're supposed to be able to pick it up with your fingers and yeah. Wow, that that actually is really good. I mean, genuinely. That's right, no? mm. Mm -hmm. Really nice. And I always thought pike was really bony and so therefore really hard to eat, but... Well, it's not particularly, is it? There's a lot of meat. I mean, it's quite intimidating looking it's fish when you think about you it. You should have seen it when we were still fresh. Jeepers. <laughs> 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 I think we should drink to the mill. Yeah. 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 Cheers. To the mill. Santé. 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 The mill. And I vote. Castles dominated the medieval landscape. And Britain has some of the finest in the world. Most today are decaying relics, many of their secrets buried in time. Now, historian Ruth Goodman and archaeologists Tom Pinfold and Peter Ginn are turning the clock back to relearn the secrets of the medieval castle builders. This is the ultimate in medieval technology. The origins of our castles are French, introduced to Britain at the time of the Norman conquests of 1066. One, two, un, Here in the Burgundy region of France is Guédelon Castle, the world's biggest archeological experiment. A 25-year project to build a castle from scratch, using the same tools, techniques, and materials available in the 13th century. It's a lot of hard work at the coalface, because this is industry. For the next six months, Ruth, Peter, and Tom will experience the daily rigors of medieval construction. Drop down. Yeah. Yep. And everyday life. How work is dressed. Eight. You can really smell your food. <laughs> and the art of combat. Oh. This is the story of how to build a medieval castle. It's September. After six months of working on the castle, the team are nearing the end of their stay. They're up at dawn to start their day on the Great Tower. Oh, I love the view from up here first thing in the morning. I know, you can see for miles, can't you? Yeah. Uh, I always really amazed, you know, when you think about it, how far medieval people travelled. You, you have this image in your head, don't you? of people sticking in their own village all their lives. And then you start looking at the evidence and people move miles and miles across the whole continent. Ordinary people like us, which I just find quite exciting. Well, when you think about it, if you've got the skill set and you've got the tools, it's almost like a ticket to ride, isn't it? You can get out there because people need you. Talented builders and craftspeople were in constant demand for construction work. A job that could see them travel the world. I suppose once this project was finished, workers like ourselves, we would have had to have moved on, moved to the next castle. That might have been the next town, could have been the next country. 
So there must have been 13th century ordinary working people who were better travelled and had a wider world view than many modern people. One group of craftsmen that travelled widely from project to project were the stone cutters, elite members of the construction team. Usually free men, their experience of different sites made them experts in both military and religious architecture. In the 13th century, a mason like Clément Guérard might even have been on crusade, gathering influences from distant lands. This is your wooden template? Yes. You've got from the tracing floor? At the entrance of the chapel, there's going to be an ornate arch of alternating black and white stone. Peter and Clément are working on the first piece, but it's a complicated shape. It's very special. Here, it's round. Yeah, it's yeah. arch. Yeah. Ah, oh, right. But yeah. here, it's a right angle. Right. I ate just this small part. I need right angle here. The stone will form the base of the arch. It must fit precisely into the existing walls, but it will also determine the shape of the curve. If it's even slightly wrong, the whole arch will be misshapen. Once the shape has been marked out, Clément uses a tool called a pitch to break off larger pieces of stone. This is a bit of pith, this is a bit of sandstone. This is very, very hard, it's very, very black, and it's going to intersperse with the limestone. But because it's harder, it has to be dressed in a slightly different way. You remember we, when it's black, it's very good quality. Yeah. It's uh, the same with granite. Right. It's very hard stone. The pith is black and hard because of its high iron content and takes four times as long to dress as limestone. It was used alongside white stones to make a strong visual statement. When you are here, you come in the middle. Uh, okay. right. Always, Always to the middle. middle. Always to the middle. middle. Okay. A hard-ended tool called a punch was used to finish the job. This is different, isn't it? It's, as you say, it's so much harder. So it's, it's just a different technique, different tools. Yes. In uh, sandstone, no chisel. No chisel? No chisel. It's right. too hard. Masons were paid according to how many stones they dressed. So the final job is to add an identifying mason's mark to the stone. And now you make your mark on the top. Perfect. With old chisel. Yeah, <laughs> OK. And just on the line, and poke. Poke. Using these marks, archaeologists have been able to trace the movement of particular masons through the landscape. So we have a, a T for Tom, a P, Peter, and an R for La Russe. By the 1200s, medieval Europe was a busy, developing, connected place as workers and traders moved across the continent. A network of roads brought produce from across the world, exotic luxuries like silks and spices. The textile industry was at its peak in 13th century Europe, and castles were a major consumer of fabrics. One of the most important elements of the industry was the trade in dyes. This is woad, the stuff that produces a blue dye. And it grows quite well in Britain, but in France, the climate means that it, it has a much higher concentration of the active ingredients that produce the blue. By the 13th century, it became quite an important cash crop in northern France, where large quantities were grown and processed and sold right across northern Europe. Karen Grunau is an expert in traditional dyeing techniques. Why are we cutting it rather than pulling it, Karen? Because we need just the leaves, we don't need the roots, and it will grow up again. So two or three times in a year we can cut it. So you get several harvests out of the same plants. Well, that's useful, isn't it? It doesn't look very blue at the moment, does it? The woad leaves don't last long in their fresh form. 
So they were specially prepared before they could be sold. I'm not seeing any blue. It still looks just like green leaves. First, we have to ground these cut leaves, and then we have to make balls. This will open up a little bit the leaves, and the first blue will come out. So for the moment, you can, there's no colour coming out of that no, at all. No, no. How on earth people discovered this, I don't know. When the world is ground up, enzymes are released, which start to convert chemicals in the leaves into the blue dye. And this first stage in which we're pressing it into balls, yeah. that's also about this, transport. This is for the transport. It is easier to transport these balls Mm -hmm. than the leaves. And then as this dries, the first chemical processes are happening. Yes, you will see when it is dry, this will be a little bit blue. The colour is changing already. I mean, that's... Mm. It's got a bluey tinge yeah. to it, hasn't it? it? I mean, it's still obviously green, but it is a slightly more bluey green. Well, there's my first one. <laughs> Today, the forests at Guédelon provide a plentiful source of wood for building the castle. But this wasn't always the case. From the 11th century, huge forest clearances occurred across Europe as farms and towns expanded and new castles were built. Tom is helping to fetch some wood to make a new door. One of the great things about spending time at Gidlon is actually getting to work with the horses. And when you think about the amount of wood needed to build a castle, there is no better way than to get out here with a horse, tie it up, and off we go. The forest at Gedelon spent 12 hectares. Oh, 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 oh. But today, as in the 13th century, wood is a valuable commodity and must be treated with care. Right now, we're taking this log out, and we're allowed to drag it because basically it's not been shaped yet, it's not been worked. So the ground, it doesn't matter if it comes into contact with the bark. Medieval woodcutters would have been based out in the forest, felling and processing the wood for the carpenters. A new door is needed for the castle, and the first stage is to split a tree trunk into planks. Jean-Michel is showing me these natural splits in the wood. And this is what we need to work off. We need to follow these to get our planks. Using wedges means it's possible to split timber of any size. They're hammered into a small cut at the top of the trunk, following the natural weaknesses in the wood. I can actually start to hear the crackling of the wood as it's done to split. Once split into planks, the outer ring of sapwood must be removed. You see here, this sapwood up to the bark. This is going to be infested with insects and also maintain the moisture a bit more. We want to work with this. This is solid, this is hard, it won't rot. This has to go. The planks in the door will be held together using a mortise and loose tenon joint. The mortise is the hole and is made using an auger. So I've got to make sure I'm lined up in the middle of the mortise. I've got to make sure I don't go forwards, backwards, to the sides. Mortise and tenon joints date back thousands of years and were used in the construction of Stonehenge. He hasn't told me to stop yet, so I must be doing something right. A line of holes are drilled on each side of the plank and then the centre is chiselled out to complete the mortise. This tenon should slide reasonably easily in like that. I'm now going to bring this across. The loose tenon is threaded through each plank in the door. So we'll put the other two planks there, and the next stage will be to peg it. Making doors required advanced planning. The planks won't be pegged in place until the wood is seasoned for a year. When planks are fixed too early, they shrink, and gaps open up between them in the door. This may seem like a complicated design and a lot of work, but it's actually based on medieval examples, and this door would have lasted hundreds of years. Blue 
was very fashionable in medieval France after being adopted as the heraldic color of royalty. As Europe's largest exporter, French woad was of huge economic importance. Once dry, the woad is ground into a powder to complete its transformation into a dye, a special ingredient is needed. And now you have to put urine on. And that'll be this pot that's yes. smelling so foul, OK? Yes, of course. Everything you ever need, chemical-wise, in the past is supplied by urine, as far yes. as I can work out. The ammonia in the urine enables chemical reactions to complete the production of the dye. Lime is also added, which helps it form a sediment. Now we have to ground it again for okay. to have at the end the real blue powder. Okay. It's quite a complicated process. It is very isn't complicated. It? And now we know because it is so expensive. Because at the end, at the end, your powder, you have just one, two kilos of powders from um, a hectare of leaves. The powder dye is dissolved in an alkaline solution known as a vat. There is no oxygen in the vat which alters the dye, making it look yellow. So now, in goes the first skein of silk into the vat. And I'm trying to introduce it gently, yes. so I put not too much oxygen into yes. the vat. In it goes. So how long will we have to wait? This is the question. The longer you, you, it stays, the deeper will the blue be. Oh, look at that changing. Yeah. So at the moment, it's sort of looking the same colour as the vat. And as it comes out, it will be blue. It's green. When the silk is taken out, the dye molecules react with the oxygen in the air to slowly produce the final blue colour. It is beginning to change colour. Yeah. It's darkening. Yeah, it will be blue, I'm sure. <gasps> Look how blue that bit there's gone yeah. by my finger. Using the woad, as well as other dyes, Ruth will produce a huge range of colours. Medieval builders would have used ideas from castles and cathedrals across Europe. Master Mason Florian Renucci has brought Peter to the town of Vesele, to the Basilica of St Mary Magdalene. The basilica was an extremely important church in the late 12th century, the place where Richard the Lionheart set off on the Third Crusade. Florian has drawn inspiration for the chapel arch from a particular architectural feature at Vesele. All this architecture uh, looks from an uh, example coming from Byzantine or Roman art. For instance, they do use the two kinds of stone You've got a Romanesque arch with black stone, white stone, black stone, white stone. This is Romanesque, it's Byzantine, so it's coming from the sort of, uh, from the east. The technique of using coloured stone alternating with white stone originated in Byzantium. It spread to both the Islamic world and to Western Europe, where it inspired masons who were rediscovering ancient techniques. From the 5th century, yeah. then 11th century, wow. all the country, they don't use stone, so they forget. Right, so just, just using wood? Yes, so they have to, um, to look to the antique yeah. tradition. And so they see um, Rome, uh, Greek yeah. architecture, uh, Armenian architecture. So they think about it and they do, oh, we can do something with stone like this, well, why not? We try to do it. Byzantine-style black and white arches like these at Vesele can be seen in medieval buildings throughout Europe. And now the masons are ready to install theirs at Guédelon. We've got a former built out of wood, unique for this doorway, and we're going to build up, continuing the black, white, black, white, the limestone and the pith from the quarry here to create a beautiful archway. Both sides of the arch are built in parallel to make sure the stones are absolutely level and the keystones will fit. 
The stone Clermont Peter dressed in the lodge is at the base of the arch, so it's vital that it's positioned perfectly. Now it all makes sense, this stone that we've seen Clermont work on, we can see the bit that sticks out there that goes into the curtain wall that leads towards the Great Hall. The curve here that is going to become the curve of the doorway, that Gothic arch. Uh, the stones have been measured precisely to allow room for the lime mortar. But only the parts exposed to the air will set properly. And certainly there are Roman buildings that have been taken apart and inside they have found that that mortar, that lime mortar, in 2,000 years, it's not gone off. In 2,000 years, it's not set. It is still as wet as this is today. The last stones to go in are the keystones. The stones are marked with arrows to show their orientation. But it's not always foolproof. We're just spinning this keystone around. And there we have it, our final arch. Last-minute adjustments are made to the stones using wooden wedges, which will hold them in position while they set. As much as this is as precise as it can be, and it's, it's almost down to millimetre perfection. When you're here, when you're at the coal face, you've just got to tickle it a little bit to get it to work. It's like when you buy your flat pack furniture, there's always a few bits left over, isn't there? What do they do? Once the stones are in place, the wooden former can be removed to reveal the arch. While the door Tom made is seasoning, he's come to work on another door that was prepared a year ago. It must now be trimmed to size to fit inside the kitchen doorway. What I found really interesting, actually, they orientated the saw blade at a right angle to the saw. So by turning the saw, you can use this two-handed up and down technique to work across and cut cleanly. And that's the secret. Two strap hinges will form an integral part of the door, spanning the planks and helping to reinforce them. Blacksmith Martin Claudel is making them from strips of iron. First, they need to be hammered flat, a task requiring a real team effort. Hammer, 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 get it in. Bellows, bellows, bellows. Right temperature, out again. Hammer, hammer, hammer. You really do need a team of people working yes. with you, don't you? Mm -hmm. But it's so funny to work together. So you've got to be friends, otherwise... <laughs> no, it's not working. <laughs> But working together isn't always easy. And uh, we need to strike uh, less stronger, but more precise. Pas de problème. The end of the strap needs to be trimmed and curved round to form the part of the hinge that will hang on the wall. This curve must be firmly secured in place. So now we are ready for the forge weld. Forge welding involves joining two pieces of metal together using intense heat, where the iron is nearly molten. Martin is using sand as a flux, which keeps the surfaces clean, helping the metal to bond. We're almost at that crucial temperature now, between 1300 and 1400 degrees. The heat coming off here is much more intense than it has been. This is when Martin's going to hammer those two bits of metal together to seal off that hinge. He's going to have to work really quickly.
At the opposite end of the scale of metalwork was the production of gold thread, a highly skilled craft, dominated mostly by women. Ruth and her daughter Eve, who works with historic textiles, are attempting to make some using gold foil. So there it is. It's not as thin as the usual gold leaf. Gold foil would have been made by hammering gold coins between leather until around half a millimetre thick. So we're going to want little ribbons cut that are sort of, you know, no more than a millimetre. Well, it just seems to be about getting the amount, right amount of pressure, doesn't it? Well, it's kind of straight. Oh, do you want to have a go at seeing if you can wrap it? Ruth and Eve are experimenting with their technique. They're holding the silk core in place between two pins while they attempt to wind the ribbons around the core. This is sort of madness, isn't it? People talk about lost crafts all the time. This is something that you could say really, really is, is lost. lost. This doesn't appear to be working terribly well. Maybe we could turn it by rolling it with our fingers. Oh! Oh, I think I've got it. I did it's it! Working. I did it! Look at that! Look! It looks like gold thread. Yeah. It's got that sort of stiff, fancy flexibility that's completely different from the silk. Gold thread was typically found in a special type of embroidery, known as Opus Anglicanum, made almost exclusively in London. Renowned for its complicated stitching, it appeared on the finest fabrics, from the vestments of bishops and popes to elaborate wall hangings in great castles. Ruth is attempting to make a small piece to mount on a cushion. Eve is making silk braid on a box loom to use as a trim. So this is something that is supposed to have a seven-year apprenticeship. <laughs> and you're doing it with how many years apprenticeship? Uh, about five minutes. Brilliant. Yeah. So I'm, I don't know quite how it's going to go. Using the silk she dyed, Ruth starts with split stitching, a technique where each stitch is punctured by the next. It means that you get a very dense line, mm. but it also means that you can be very accurate in where the, the line twists and turns to. The second technique, an underside couched stitch, was used to attach the gold thread. So I'm going to have a go at some of this gold. So if I lay a little piece of our gold thread across there. Now, the sewing is done with this thread, this fine linen thread. Mm. So what has to happen is it comes up and round it. Now, the point is that I have to get this thread back through exactly the same hole that it came up in. But that's not where you stop. Then you grab hold of the linen thread from behind and you have to pull. And what I'm trying to do is to pull it so hard that it pops a bit of the gold thread through the fabric. I'm hauling the thread through. During its heyday in the mid-13th century, Opus Anglicanum was traded for huge sums, only affordable to nobles, kings, and the richest clergy. I mean, nowadays people think of this as, you know, sort of a lady's occupation, as a bit of frippery on the side, but there was a real industry in the 13th century run by women. Indeed, the best English embroidery seems to have been done in professional secular workshops in London. Yeah. You can have your own shop, you can, you can be in charge of yourself and of apprentices and staff. And it's the only profession that you can really do that and get the full recognition as being a master of your trade. At the Chapel Tower, the next phase of the entrance hall has begun. With the addition of the doorways, this chapel is really taking shape. I mean, this is the internal doorway, pintles here. Only the Lord is going to come into this space. You then have this kind of lobby area with the external ornate doorway, this black and white, this Byzantine-influenced structure. Up the spiral staircase. 
And then you've got the arch there. And this external door to the chapel needs to be connected to that, to the internal doorway of the chapel, by barrel vaulting to enclose all this space. The barrel vault will form a curved ceiling, linking the two chapel entrances and creating a corridor. It will be built on top of a wooden former. Arches mark out the shape of the vault, and the lathes provide a surface on which to place the stones. Layer mason Constantin Lamel is in charge. If you want to, to have the demonstration, yeah. just cover that, and you have the name. Right, yeah. Like, like that, you can see it's look, it just looks like a bubble. Yeah. <laughs> You have the name. They, they, they wasn't very creative for the names. <laughs> the lathes are laid loosely in place and not nailed, so they can be easily removed once the vault is built. To fit tightly in place, the stones need to have regular edges, so the first job is to straighten them off. It's uh, just that little lump there needs to come off. Now that's the problem. I have actually hit that one too many times. You can just see there's a crack forming there. My lovely square edge is, uh, is compromised. And you can see it's all the way there. I'm gonna probably break that off with my hands, which I can. The stones are tested on the former to ensure that there are no gaps, which might cause weakness. thing I realise is this castle gets built twice. Firstly, every stone is put in place to see if it fits there. Then it's taken out, mortar's added, and it goes back in. By the end of it, enough energy will have expended to have built two castles. Once their positions are finalised, they're mortared into place. But the weather isn't on their side. The rain will wash away the mortar, so there's a drive to get it finished and covered up. It's like a row of rotten teeth. It's like a, it's like a porcupine that's been run over. It's not nice. But when we remove those formers, it should be beautiful stone. Finally, the last stone is in place. You can check that it's already good. Uh, yeah. Uh, if it wasn't. Uh, the, the, the former couldn't resist that. <laughs> <laughs> that is trust. With the advent of Gothic architecture, increasingly ambitious structures could be built in castles. On the tracing floor, Clement is planning what will be one of the most complicated projects at Guédelon so far. This all looks so much more intricate than the other things I've seen, so much more delicate. What are you drawing up? Um, the grand, uh, la grande fenêtre a big for window. la chapelle. A big window for the chapel? Yes. Oh, well, that would have to be grand, wouldn't it? Yes. The chapel window is a Gothic arch made up of 34 individually carved pieces and incorporating two smaller arches, a popular design of the time. Now, that's a very, very gothic shape, isn't it? It's a, yes. when a sort of, whenever you're thinking of gothic arches, that's pretty much what you have in mind. It's a good period for the stonemason. Yes? 13th century, it's perfect. Church, cathedral. Yeah. Of course, gothic architecture had been around for quite a while by 1250, but it had been developed and was concentrated in ecclesiastical buildings, churches, cathedrals, monasteries. For a castle, this is quite fashionable and new to have a gothically pointed window. You do really have to think in sort of three dimensions, don't you? I mean, how it's going to look from every angle, the front, the back, the sides, the... I dream the part of a part of a window. Do you really? Yes. <laughs> I, I work uh, all the day on the, on, the, on the castle. I dream about it at night, yeah. Now, these windows, you have just two stones ready. <laughs> these stones and these stones, it's here. It is just, two here. Just two stones. Just the two out of all of it. Oh, it's a good way. That's <laughs> good. A good start. 
The mortar is still setting on the chapel tower vault. So Peter has come to help Tom install the kitchen door. That cart looks a bit too small for this door. <laughs> Blacksmith Vincent Granon and carpenter Stefan Boudy are both needed for what is a tricky job. Do look the fact this is a moment of Gedlon where the crafts come together. You've got the blacksmith and you've got the carpenter and you've got the jokers. <laughs> <laughs> the door needs to be edged carefully into place and held in position before the hinges can be nailed on. I think this entire castle has been built in small wooden wedges. <laughs> One of the main problems we've got is this is 100 kilos worth of door at least. They've got to get it right. And right now, they're not sure whether to try and shave off some of that render or actually cut some of that wood to fit it in. These strap hinges are starting to fit into these chiseled grooves. The hinges must be attached precisely. A few centimetres out of place, and the door won't open. Wow. We have a door. Looks like an eye made them from this side. The nails need to be bent over to anchor them in place. So hold the sledgehammer against it, the head of the nail, door in tight against the wall, and then you're bending that over to create a staple. Yeah, well, blimey. There's a lot more movement in this than you think. Oh, 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 oh. You are on the wrong nail. I'm holding this one. <laughs> <laughs> this process of hammering the nail over and tucking it in, it's really acted as a staple and pull these together. And I didn't realise you'd have a, a little claw digging back into the wood. This isn't getting shifted for anything. With valuable produce stored in the kitchen, heavy doors would have helped keep the area secure. Perhaps the most expensive commodities in a castle kitchen were the spices, imported from the East. The returning crusaders of the 13th century had acquired a taste for spice, and it became popular with wealthy lords. Ruth is making gingerbread. Because of its long journey to Europe, ginger was only available in dried form and must be ground into a powder. This is the first and the most important spice that I'm going to be using in making some gingerbread. Every single grain of spice that was used had to come the overland route, the old silk route. You mustn't think of a Chinese merchant making his way all the way to medieval France. Instead, you must think of that Chinese merchant selling his wares to another merchant who takes them to the next market and sells them to another merchant. By the time it gets here, it may well have passed through 30, 40 different hands with a small profit accrued at every stage of the journey. Spices were desired as much for their culinary properties as they were as a status symbol. Gingerbread also included nutmeg, red peppercorns, cloves and cinnamon. The extreme expense of something like this, and I do mean extreme expense, meant that the only people who could afford it were the nobility and royalty. You were, after all, eating something that was worth more than pure gold by quite a long way. The ground spices are made into a paste with honey. Next, bread is combined with some red wine. This is best done with a hand. The spice and honey paste is added. And the mixture is set on a board. So I'm just going to take the pulp and spread it out thin. It doesn't look very appetising at this stage, does it? <laughs> so I'm going to tidy it up, because once it is dry, I want to cut it into perfect little lozenges. It gets dished out rather parsimoniously. <laughs> a little lozenge now and again, only for your very best guests. The barrel vault has been setting overnight, and now the formers need to be removed. If the masons have got it wrong, 
the whole vault could collapse. There's no reason why this should fall in, but you never know. It is the ultimate appraisal of their work. And that is the reason why I've got a hard hat on, because this is medieval technology, but we are in the modern world. The first stage is to lower the scaffolding uprights that are supporting the formers. This will drop all the scaffolding down, and then we can start taking the formers out. As they hit that wood, as they hit those wedges, I can feel the vibrations in this arch. But don't show it. It's good. Potentially it's good. Now I'm yeah. very glad. Because uh, I, I don't tell you, but... Uh, <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> the vault can push. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and no, I think, yes, but uh, no, nothing has been pushed. So, good. We are going to see now. Hey, it's good. I'm actually standing in the most dangerous position, it seems. <laughs> With the scaffolding lowered, the wooden lathes can come out followed by the formers. So we're going to go to the top. Oh, là. Ça va? Ouais, ça va. As the formers and lath come out, the fresh mortar is dropping down from the barrel vault. But it emphasizes the fact that the mortar isn't integral to the structure. It's the stones themselves that create the arch that creates the strength in the vault. You're now indoors, Florian. You've got a roof over your head. Mm. You're happy, are you? You're happy? Yes. That's a wonderful word. Now all that's left to do is a bit of clearing up. Ah! Oh! There's still raining water oh. here. Oh. It's up. It is up. What do you think? <laughs> I can see a hole. Always a critic. <laughs> It made a nice, like, Battenberg cake out of stone. <laughs> <laughs> Always thinking of your tummy. <laughs> Don't listen to him. I think it's lovely. It's late summer, and life at the castle is in full flow. Livestock would have been kept in the grounds, from poultry to sheep, and at Gedelon, they're enjoying the sunshine. These are our castle sheep. They're from the Isle of Weston, off the coast of Brittany. And they're essentially the closest thing you're going to find to medieval sheep. They're much smaller than modern breeds. And when they were around the castle in the medieval time, they would have been essentially wild. Ruth has finished her embroidery cushion. Well, it's good for me. I can see why I'd need another six years, 11 months, and three weeks apprenticeship, mind to be any good, really. First attempt. And Peter is dealing with the effects of working on a medieval building site. The problem with lime mortar is it just, the lime is so caustic, it's so corrosive, and it just dries out the skin. So I've, I've taken to just applying a bit of pig fat, which for me, just keeps my hands soft and supple. One of the major problems, it does smell. And there's more dogs than people on this site, and I am currently the dog's best friend. Castle building was seasonal work, lasting from the spring to the autumn. At the end of a season, unfinished walls would be sealed with a layer of mortar to protect them from rain and frost. But for the decorative chapel window, this won't be possible. So the team are working hard to finish the project before the winter weather arrives. Well, it's more than two stones now. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, plus those two that were here before. <sighs> but we've got 34 in total to do, so the Mason's Lodge, you can hear it, is ringing with people working. And when you look at them, I mean, the intricacy the complicated nature of this stone carving. It's no wonder it's taking so long. In fact, so 
much work is there to do. They've opened a second lodge over the far side of the castle and anyone who can work stone at all is being dragooned into making the window. Intricate stonework was in high demand and masons were employed based on their work in other buildings. Window design was particularly important and something the lord of a castle would have direct influence over. Ruth has come for a lesson in fine masonry with Mathieu Carnevillier. How long has this stone taken? Um, three, four, four, four days. Four days? Yeah. And she's no finish. A stonemason's apprenticeship lasted seven years. So for Ruth, this is a very valuable stone to start on. So what's the technique? It's not difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Hard work, though. <laughs> Just, li Just a little bit like of an angle. Just like this. Like this so. Ah, ah, ah I see. And I'm just sort of wearing down the surface. Too hard, too soft? Yeah, it's perfect. It's okay. Like it's a really strange mix of it. It's between something that's very delicate and, on the other hand, really heavy. The most detailed stones are dressed by the experienced masons, but simpler stones are supplied by the second lodge. So this is just getting the stone ready for the skilled work over there. You are not normally a mason, are you? No. No. <laughs> You're usually one of the guides, but absolutely everybody is being pressed into service to do a little bit extra. This looks pretty good to me. Can I have a go? OK, you can. Like music. So always at an angle so that I'm not going into the stone, I'm going across the stone. This is an awful lot more crude than I was doing in the other lodge. It's actually a heck of a lot easier. You might think trying to chip big bits off is harder than chipping teeny weeny 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 bits off, but it's not. These are so much lighter for a start. The stones for the windowsill are ready to be put in place. I think of everything that we've done here at Gedlon. I find this the most stressful because the amount of work that's gone into this, and you get it wrong and you crack that stone, that's it, you know. Well, not that's it, but that'll be forever in the, the record of Gedlon, your mistake. The carving on the limestone blocks is incredibly delicate. Uh, Flat braided ropes, known as torsh, are used to protect the stones during transit. And even the wooden rollers are specially shaped and smoothed so they don't cause damage. I mean, I've, I've been into probably hundreds of churches. I've looked at possibly thousands of windows. I have never appreciated just how much work goes into making them. That's a real mixture of pre-planning, execution. But they're just making adjustments as they go and they're talking all the time, communicating. It's a real team effort. We've learned a lot from this. Before their time at the castle comes to an end, Ruth has gone to experience something which would have been commonplace yet extraordinary in the 13th century. Going on pilgrimage. For many people who lived in the same community their whole lives, this was a chance to see the world and temporarily escape the monotony of daily life. Pilgrimage is a really big thing at this point in history, yes. isn't it? Everyone is going on pilgrimage who can. Hundreds and hundreds of people are surging up these paths. Absolutely. Meeting together, exchanging ideas, yes. feeling part of a bigger world. Ruth is on her way to the town of Veselay to visit the Basilica of St Mary Magdalene, one of the most important pilgrimage churches of the 13th century. Chris Kelly who runs the visitor centre will be her guide. It sort of looks like a castle, doesn't it? Or, or a fortified city, I suppose. Absolutely, it is a fortified city. You can see the width of this gate. 
which is more than four meters, which is enormous. Yeah, so in fact, them. you can understand it's not for defensive purposes, it's for processions. In fact, it's the pilgrim entrance. So wide because there were so many people. And this goes direct up to the basilica. From the early 11th century, the relics of Mary Magdalene were displayed at Vesely. News of miracles spread, and the church soon became a center for pilgrims. One of the four starting points on the road to Santiago de Compostela, Vesely was a religious destination of huge importance. Today, the pilgrimage of Le Père de Famille is taking place. This ritual of walking across the landscape to come for spiritual reflection is the same now as it would have been in the Middle Ages. So when the pilgrim arrived here, uh, he would, when he walked in through those doors, naturally his eyes are drawn up to this uh, semicircle of sculpted stone. And the first person he's going to see is Christ there. So we've got Christ in the center. Yes. And he seems to have ridiculously big hands, as far as I can see. <laughs> yeah. So the hand represents welcome. He's welcoming everybody who comes into this place. On the far right, there are two people with very big ears. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some people say they look like wings. Uh, and in fact, they're seen as a reference to St. Benedict's rule. Open the ears of your heart and listen to the master inside. That is to say, be who you are to the fullness of who you are. I think most of us, when we think about medieval people and their, and their experience of religion, we, we tend to think that people were largely ignorant. But this, this is a very sophisticated way sophisticated. of thinking. Of course, the monks, their roles is to explain to each person when they arrive. You could think of it like a visit to the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, and experts have to tell you what to think almost about it. Yes. It's got an element of that tourism and... Yes, you might call it spiritual tourism. A once humble church, the basilica was expanded to make room for all the pilgrims. Kings, nobles and abbots came along with thousands of ordinary folk to venerate the relics and confess their sins. Pilgrimage can be understood as a physical journey that helps you to have a spiritual journey by leaving behind everyday life. You are putting yourself into the right frame of mind to help yourself grow inside. It's been an endeavor of epic proportions, but the intricate carved stones for the chapel window are now ready to be installed. Over 2,700 hours' work have gone into shaping and refining the delicate pieces, crafted out of 15 tons of stone. How long do these take to make, then? Mm. 15 days. Are you pleased with the results? Yes, perfect. <laughs> Time, it's not important. Yeah, so. As long as you get it right. With stonework this delicate, it's important to get it securely installed quickly so the surrounding walls can be built up to protect it. This is a massive push to get this finished because the chapel's got to be covered up before those, that bad weather sets in. Otherwise, all that work can be, can be undone. And this really is medieval crunch time. One of the most critical pieces is the mullion, the central pillar which will support both of the internal arches in the window. But there's a problem. It's too tall. This must be corrected before the stone can go in, or the rest of the window won't fit together properly. That mullion for the window is a centimetre too long, so Clement is going to have to shave a perfect centimetre off the bottom of that mullion prior to it going in, prior to them finishing the window. <coughs> I mean, there's already a time pressure, and things like this is just going to... You can't plan for that at all, can you? Well, this is Gidlon, isn't it? This is the, the whole purpose, learning as you do. Clement's last-minute adjustment will be put to the test, as the rest of the stones can now be painstakingly eased into position. Ooh. 
Are they happy? It's hard to tell. <laughs> and the formers are removed. Everyone who worked on the window has come to see it finally revealed. I have to look everywhere because it's beautiful everywhere. All the gothic forms are made by the light. So here it's uh, white and here it's dark. It's like a painting. Now, the key question, are you happy? <laughs> I think yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not sure what he thinks. <laughs> yes, I am. With the window finished, the team's time at Guédelon is coming to an end. The seasonal nature of castle building meant many of the workers were itinerant, moving from place to place and seeking other employment in the winter months. All that's left to do is to tidy the site and clear the hovel. But with 13th century accommodation so sparsely furnished, there's not much to pack up. Ruth just needs to clean the floor. These rushes have been down for a couple of months now. They are beginning to get quite trodden down and quite broken up. Underneath the surface, which still looks reasonably clean, I really was expecting to see insects moving around. I was expecting to see mouse droppings. And it's just not here. So this is obviously the moment to clear it all out. The most important thing I think I've learned on site is how to put technique before anything else. You don't go in with pure strength or force, but you learn the techniques that allow you to work for long periods of time and work accurately. If you get your technique right, then everything else will follow. Hey. Hey. <laughs> I really like seeing the way the geometry has come into play. We all studied this at schools. It seems so distant and pointless, and yet, here, we can see exactly what it's all for. And now, when I look at all of the built world, I can see the geometry. I can see why those lessons actually were really important. Gedlong is the largest experimental archaeology project in the world. But the castle itself is merely a byproduct. The experiment is creating the Chantier Medieval, the medieval building site, having seen just how much work goes into laying, say, a single stone, whenever I see a ruined castle, I won't be looking at the building itself. I'll be looking at the hundreds of craftspeople that were involved in that project, the thousands of hours of labor that went to make it, and the community that surrounded it. How do you build a castle? Well, I know now. Hi, Ruth. Uh, Aha, look. What have we got there? Ooh. We have some wine and some gingerbread. Bit of a treat. Doesn't that look amazing? It does, doesn't it? It's incredible. I mean, this morning it was just pieces of stone in the mason's lodge and it, it just looked like a ruin. And they brought them up here, put them together, and it, it just is beautiful. I really have got a new respect yeah. for, for the builders of the past. <sighs> it's changed my view entirely. Such a fitting place to end our journey because we started down there on the chapel floor, we've marked out the centre, and in a season we've come up with... We're 12, 15 feet higher up, at least, with our... Food of kings. Food of kings. I'm going to try this. <laughs> Drink of men. 
Oh, that's, uh, that's full of flavour. Yeah. Well, I think, don't you? To the window and to get along. To the window and get along. Window and get along. But we do get along, you know, most of the time. <laughs> <laughs>